I see you, Andreas. Hi, Margrethe. Great to see you. We're just about to, be, to get started. Great you're with us. No, I'm, I've been looking so much forward. I just blew my flag a bit. So, so that people see who I am. <laughs> they might guess who you are. Yeah, but you never know. I can get to shoes. Hi, Isabel. Hello, Margrethe. Good to see you. Yes, how are you? Hi, thank you. And you? I'm good. I'm good. A bit tired of this COVID thing, but if I'm the only one, then I'll live. <laughs> now, how is Paris? It's good. We have a very nice uh, sunny weather, and so we, uh, we try to, to get along and <laughs> continue working. And uh, it's, uh, the curfew is a bit difficult to, to, to manage because uh, everybody has to be home at six, so it's very early. Uh, so the, the okay. I'm, sorry. Very... I'm sorry to interrupt you. We are already live. Okay, no problem. <laughs> oh, I start with my, my welcoming note. Um, dear Mr. Altmaier, uh, dear uh, Mrs. Westhager, dear Margrethe, dear colleagues around the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and a warm welcome to the 20th International Conference on Competition. For obvious reasons, we cannot be in Berlin these days. We cannot meet in this famous restaurant Nolle for our first evening which is a pity, of course, but it's for obvious reasons. For the time being, we cannot meet neither here in Germany nor somewhere else. Uh, the upside of this virtual event is, of course, uh, that we have a broad, much broader scope of people taking part. We have round about uh, 1,200 registered participants today, which makes me very happy, of course. Um, as in recent years, this conference really lives up to its name. We have 18 speakers uh, from 11 countries, all participants from around the world, from many continents. Um, I think that the conference is dedicated to topics um, that are currently moving not only us at the Bundeskartellamt, but also others around the world. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to the interview, the keynote interview that we are going to have with our minister, my minister, for Economic Affairs and Energy, Mr. Peter Altmaier. Hello, Mr. Altmaier, great, to, to, great you're with us. And uh, Executive Hello. President Margrethe Vestager, who is with us as well. Um, we will interview both of them, and I will do that together with my colleague, Isabel de Silva, uh, my colleague uh, from the uh, Autorité de la Concurrence in Paris. Hello, uh, Isabel, to you as well. Hello, Andrea. Bonjour à Paris. Bonjour, madame. Bonjour, monsieur le ministre. We will discuss how, uh, how business and government are shaping the economy. And I'm also looking forward to a keynote that we are going to hear by Christian Klein, the CEO of SAP, because this conference is well known for not only talking about the industry, but for talking with the industry. And I think that is a very important feature. Uh, I'm looking forward to two panels that we're going to, going to have. The first panel will deal with the role of competition policy towards the tech, how to tame the tech giants around the world. Do we need further regulation? Do we really need to break them up as discussed in the United States? We will uh, discuss this uh, in the first panel, which is moderated by Professor Ruprecht Potsun, a professor at Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. And by the way, um, a colleague of us at the Bundeskartellamt in former times. Uh, the second panel will focus on sustainability and other public policy objectives. With sustainability, other social aspects and fairness have gained much attention. And the question arises as how to deal with these questions as a competition authority. Um, this debate will be moderated by Mr. Ingo Brinker, a partner at Gleis Lutz and the chairman of the Competition Lawyers Association here in Germany. So having said that, we're looking forward to a lively debate. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the keynote interview that we are going to have right now. Business or government, who is shaping our economy? I don't need to introduce uh, neither Margrethe Westeyer nor Peter Altmaier 
uh, nor Isabel de Silva. I've done that already. So we can get right into, into substance. And uh, Isabel, I pass the floor to you. Uh, you have the first question. Yes. So this is best. Yes. Thank you, Andreas, for this introduction. And may I say again how pleased and honored I am to, to participate in this virtual uh, Berlin conference, because this Berlin conference is always a, a highlight of the year uh, and a very important moment for the German competition uh, 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 world, but also worldwide with many delegates. So we are doing this online this year. Uh, and it is uh, really a pleasure to have this opportunity to, to discuss um, what we have been going through uh, last year and what are the, the, the prospects for the future. So I would like to start, Margrethe, by a, a question about uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, the reason why uh, I thought it would be a, a good point to start is that we have been going through one of the most severe health crisis that Europe has uh, ever faced. And this uh, COVID-19 crisis has shown how important it is to have a well-functioning pharma industry, how crucial, vital it is to have medicines, vaccines that can be developed in a, in a short time. Uh, and so this shows us that it's important that the, the pharmaceutical companies have the right incentives to invest in innovation, in finding new vaccines. Uh, and in a very short time. Uh, so they need to have the, the right incentives to innovate and to produce the, the, the medicines and the vaccines that we need. There may even be cases for pro-competitive cooperation when we are facing very uh, unusual times like we have uh, known uh, with the COVID crisis. Uh, but at the same time, it is uh, very crucial that we maintain a well-functioning competitive environment. So there is also a role for competition and forces. And I would like to, to um, emphasize how active the commission has been in the, in the field of the pharmaceutical industry, because uh, last autumn, the commission has adopted a pharma strategy. And one of the objectives was to have more affordable medicines. And also very recently, the, the European Commission announced a, a very important antitrust decision. I'm talking about the Aspen decision on the, uh, on the pricing of a, a drug against cancer. And in this uh, quite innovative decision, uh, the Commission accepted commitments uh, that will lead to uh, significant price cuts over the years for, the, for drugs against cancer that are sold by the Aspen company. And uh, also in other uh, jurisdictions, for example, the French authority released last year uh, an important decision uh, sanctioning abuse practices uh, um, concerning companies that had hindered the access to, to prices, to lower prices medicines. So I would like to ask you uh, against this background, uh, what do you see as the priorities of the Commission? And what is the specific role of competition policy to make sure that this pharma pharmaceutical industry uh, gives us the results that we need? Um, well, thank you very much, uh, both for, for enabling that we have the 20th uh, conference. Uh, I think maybe somehow we can redo it physically next year, but this is just a, a dry run. No, it is for real, uh, because these are real issues uh, to be discussed. And uh, I really appreciate this focus on the pharma industry and congratulations on, uh, on your decision uh, last year. I think it's extremely important. I think it's extremely important that citizens see that competition authorities, no matter where we are placed, uh, do our utmost both to enable uh, positive pro-competitive uh, cooperation uh, and here you know we have the uh, antitrust temporary framework uh, that has enabled uh, cooperation in order to uh, prevent shortages of some uh, essential drugs uh, used uh, during the COVID, not COVID medicine, uh, not vaccines, but some of the many drugs that are being used when you just come into an, an emergency uh, unit. Uh, so I think that enabling role uh, is very important. Uh, we also see it in, um, uh, in our merger work. Uh, we had quite a 
quite a high level of concentration in the pharmaceutical industry over the last uh, five, 10 years. Uh, and one of the things that we have seen as important is the investigations into some of the pipeline molecules to make sure that we still have, you know, this innovation uh, in the marketplace, both as, as a theory of harm in itself, that innovation may be limited, but also innovation as a supportive uh, measure uh, to enable the viability, for instance, of a remedy taker. So also from the merger side of things, I think it's really important uh, to be uh, vigilant. Um, last but not least, uh, of course, uh, it is still important uh, to look at uh, the way pharmaceutical companies um, uh, are doing. Uh, your uh, decision is a very good example. Uh, I think the Aspen decision uh, where we accepted, uh, as you say, commitments. Uh, since 2012, uh, Aspen has um, raised prices uh, sometimes over 300% for six essential uh, drugs in treating cancer, uh, one of them in leukemia in children. Uh, and here, not only did we get a price cut uh, on average and 72% of so bringing prices down under what they were before the abuse began, but also um, supply commitments. And that is a point that we are very much aware of because some of the smaller jurisdictions within the union, smaller member states, they are reporting issues of not being able to procure what they would want to procure. And I think that's, or, or being stressed in, 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 in that, those endeavors. So here, I think it's, it's really important. And on, on the price point, uh, we have now had a number of, uh, of pay for delay cases. Uh, and that ought to give sufficient guidance uh, to the industry. Uh, but just today, uh, actually, we opened uh, against uh, Teva on a suspicion of uh, a drug against uh, multiple uh, sclerosis uh, that Teva may have hindered uh, the upcoming of a, a competitor by a number of, uh, of different uh, actions, one of them using patent litigation uh, as one of the tools here. This is, of course, absolutely preliminary, but I think it shows sort of the, the breadth uh, of what we are doing and what we are doing together. They pay for the lay cases, excessive pricing cases, other cases where you see that they are not uh, playing by the book. And I think it's really important because we need the pharmaceutical sector so much. And you have so many companies who play absolutely by the book. Uh, which is obviously recognized in also our protection. Of a, of a patent, because it is completely legitimate that you have higher prices to remunerate innovation. Uh, so I think the most important uh, message, except for the message to citizens and, and governments uh, that we will be there, is for all the pharmaceutical companies who play this by the book, that we will make sure that they are faced with fair competition and not with unfair competition. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Mr. Altmaier, um, talking about the pharmaceutical sector, uh, Germany has become a share shareholder in CureVac um, and is also a shareholder in, in other companies that has been driven by the pandemic as well. So uh, there are people out there who wonder if this enormous state aid that we have seen during the pandemic, um, uh, what, what the effect will, will that be? And, um, some people are wondering that if, if this situation lasts for longer, if the state uh, could fall into the role of an entrepreneur. So the question is, are we getting used to a more state-driven economy during the pandemic? Um, I always said that, that uh, state aid, state intervention during, during the pandemic uh, is a clear matter because I think in this situation, the state, the government clearly cannot stand at the sidelines. But what happens after the pandemic? Uh, do you agree that uh, the state should, should get out of the shares that he's holding by these companies? So the question is, is that really temporary what we see for the time being? Or is this something that will continue even after the pandemic? Well, um, as far as uh, I'm concerned, Andreas Mund, uh, uh, I uh, uh, have always said that the state uh, can never be a good entrepreneur 
and there should be a political self-restraint um, from uh, taking um, microeconomic decisions inside uh, companies. I, I don't, don't see it as healthy. And um, as far as I'm concerned, um, we have um, we have made uh, with the uh, authorization and the approval of the Commission, and I'm really grateful to Margareta and her services, uh, which uh, have been busy day and night uh, to enable us to do it. We have made at the disposal of uh, more than two million companies in Germany. Uh, several hundred of billions of euros in order to preserve the uh, substance uh, of our economy and of our uh, competitiveness. Um, and this was in 99% of all the cases without, without um, uh, uh, buying any shares from the companies concerned, without interfering, even not for for a little bit in the um, internal decision making of the companies concerned there are two two exceptions if you uh, 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 if you uh, if i can put it like this one was german lufthansa german lufthansa was awarded a loan of uh, more than 6 billion euro in order to um, keep it alive as a um, global competitor in the civil aviation. Um, and given the fact uh, that the taxpayer's money that was made available without any guarantee that it will come back at 100%, um, it was a decision uh, to, um, uh, to take over a small amount of shares. Uh, and we have indicated, the Minister of Finance, myself, our willingness to privatize it again as soon as it is possible. Um, we have, um, in the, the context of Kyrovik, uh, also um, um, uh, acquired some shares of the company. And this was um, in order to enable the company to stay in Europe and in Germany while um, collecting um, money um, worldwide for further investment. And it worked so far. Personally, uh, when I had in our last um, conference two years ago, I remember that was a, a little earthquake when I had presented days uh, ahead of the conference my industrial strategy paper. Uh, and already then I emphasized that I believe that the total amount of state-owned shares of companies shall not exceed a certain limit so that we should oblige uh, the state to sell uh, old or, and other shares when it believes uh, it should um, it should buy uh, some new ones uh, i must say i was a little bit surprised uh, when i suggested selling some of the stocks we have uh, acquired over the last 10, 15, 20 years um, uh, in order to, uh, to improve public finance, uh, how, how, how much resistance there was across, um, across many, many uh, uh, ranks of uh, economists. But this is a debate that is necessary. And I believe the heritage from the last 30 years is the state is not a good entrepreneur and the state has to commit itself to self-restraint. Many thanks, Mr. Altmaier. These were very clear words, and uh, I think they're well received in the competition community. Many thanks. Isabel. Yes, thank you, Andreas. And uh, Mr. Minister Altmaier, I would like to keep on with this debate about how we need to change uh, the economic policy to, to face current times. Uh, and I would like to tackle the issue of industrial policy. It is a topic in which you are very active. Uh, you have been very active in um, uh, stating the fact that um, to tackle uh, challenges of the economic policy, such as the digital economy, the en energy transition, or the fact that China is, is a very strong competitor and has a, a special way of doing business with Europe, you have uh, proposed that 
uh, Europe should change its approach, for example, by being more active in terms of uh, enabling the creation of European champions in the industry, but also, and this is uh, on the German legislative front, by uh, creating new legal tools, such as uh, the, the recent change in the competition law in Germany, which is very innovative and um, has drawn a lot of attention across the world because uh, the German competition agency receives new tools to, to tackle digital platforms. And I would like to, to, to know uh, how you appreciate the, the changes that we have seen over the past few years. For example, uh, in response to the crisis, uh, Germany and France have been very active in uh, promoting a new European data infrastructure because you thought that Europe was not present enough in those new cutting edge digital industries. Uh, but we have also seen uh, important levels of state aid that have received a green light by the European Commission, uh, for example, in the car batteries industry. So that is another area of the industry where the, the state will be quite present. And uh, we also see that uh, this time to, to tackle the current COVID crisis, the government is intervening with very massive subsidies. And even you have mentioned this just right now, buying stakes of selected companies to prevent uh, hostile takeovers, also uh, loaning money to the industry uh, to help it face uh, this difficult this difficult time. So I was wondering, maybe in a provocative way, how much market economy and competition is left with such a level of state intervention. Matter of fact, we have uh, brought in uh, more market economy elements than in uh, previous uh, years. When I was a child, uh, I remember that I learned uh, about uh, the uh, Franco-German-British-Spanish decision to establish Airbus as a new global competitor in civil aviation. And what did they do? They simply um, um, made a merger of pre-existing small private companies and the new company was state-owned to a large extent. And the state became an entrepreneur and did uh, interfere. Franz Josef Strauss, the Minister of Finance in Germany and later um, the uh, Bavarian Prime Minister, uh, was a chairman of the board uh, for um, almost uh, 20 years. Um, and um, then, for one reason or the other, nothing happened anymore. But we have seen a shift with regard to highly innovative technologies from Europe to other regions in the world, to the United States, to Asia, as far as consumer electronics is concerned, um, as far as platform economies, digitization is concerned. And so the question was how to respond on all those developments also fueled by the climate protection policy of the European uh, Union. And then um, after um, uh, the, the discussions with my good friend, uh, Bruno Le Maire, after discussions with the Commissioner Sefcovic and with Margarete Vestag, where we had sometimes diverging arguments and opinions, of course, that's a normal thing uh, in an in a open society. Uh, but at the, end of the, at, at the end of the day, we managed to develop something genuinely new. We have not established new um, state-owned company. We did not describe investment in certain areas, but we have developed in close cooperation uh, with the industrial branches concerned, new models for enabling uh, innovation and technological uh, change, also in response uh, to um, um, in, in response to protective measures taken by other countries and other regions of the world. So when we have decided to spend billions um, to, um, um, to produce, um, for the first time in decades, battery cells again in Europe, because there is such an enormous and growing demand for battery cells for e-cars and other uh, applications, um, then we said, okay, this is an offer to our private companies, and the private companies will decide 
whether to accept the offer, whether to accept some money uh, in order to leverage the private money that is needed uh, to achieve the aim. And the fact that we have this IPCI, important project of common European interest on battery cell production means um, that we have, for example, uh, in Germany, uh, we will have spent uh, between three and four billion euro at the end of the process, but we will have leveraged um, uh, about, um, about 12 to 15 billion euro of private investment by doing so. And the same in France uh, and in other countries. And um, that applies also to hydrogen technology. It applies to, um, uh, to semiconductors and to microprocessors. All these areas where the um, importance of innovation is very high and where the overall competitiveness of our economy is at stake, um, we have tried to define new tools as close to market economy and competition as possible, but um, also um, uh, instrumental to achieve what we have to achieve, that means a globally competitive economy um, in Europe, in the US uh, and in Asia, that's in the interest of the consumers around the world, not just in Europe. Uh, and when you look at the um, problems we are facing with regard to platform economies, that was the second part of your question, uh, then you see it is the problems arrive uh, and arise when there is no competition at all. And that is something we have uh, to avoid. Um, in, the, um, um, in the past, there was, um, there was, especially in the US, the idea, okay, if you have no competition, then you have to dismantle uh, the monopolist uh, and uh, to cut him into uh, different uh, parts and uh, companies. Now we have added a new idea and it is enabling other companies to compete. Um, I think it is innovative and you have uh, mentioned that we have uh, amended uh, our um, uh, legislation um, in order to, uh, it, is, um, uh, it is our GWB, this is um, the um, German legislation um, that um, uh, is at the heart of our national competition law. And uh, we will have for the first time, Andreas Mund will have for the first time uh, a tool uh, to avoid abusive practices with regard to big internet platforms. Uh, for example, um, when it uh, is about uh, self-preferencing, when it is uh, about uh, abuse of uh, market uh, power, um, and this is a new instrument, and I, I'm wholeheartedly convinced the mere fact that the tool exists will help us to ensure competition. Thank you, Minister, for this uh, comprehensive answer and also this um, explanation of the importance of this new Competition Act in Germany that will be, uh, of course, uh, receive a lot of comments in the, in the coming months. So, Andrea, up to you. Yeah, we have to we have to make something out of it now. Uh, my, my my question goes to Vice President Vestager, uh, Margrethe. When we talk about um, industrial policy policy strategies, uh, very often China is the elephant in in the room. Um, the CEO of Siemens, Joe Kaiser, has just left his post as CEO, uh, and not without still again once more talking about Siemens Alstom. And uh, that is something that, has really, uh, that is really an issue in the industry. Uh, the European Commission has now adopted a white paper that is dealing with the distortive effects uh, that, that are caused by foreign subsidies in the single markets. And uh, the EU and China have also started a dialogue uh, on, on state control, on state aid and all these issues. So I think the big question is also for us as competition agencies, when we weigh uh, the competitive uh, conditions in a market, uh, do you think that the initiatives that have been taken by, by the EU, um, that they are sufficient to establish 
a competitive level playing field between companies uh, coming from uh, state-driven economies and, and companies that come from yeah, private, privately driven economies uh, like Europe, because I think we all agree that we need to do something about this, um, about this level playing field. Uh, the big question might be how we're going to do that. Well, I, I do understand uh, why Kaiser is still um, uh, considering the Siemens Alstom uh, prohibition because this, the, the thought provoking thing about that was that it was a merger that could have happened if the parties had been willing uh, to remedy the very serious competition concerns. And, and I think that is exactly key to say, well, amazing things can happen as long as you as a company are still willing to be challenged. That, that is the key in our merger control. That if you, if you, if you want to go ahead, well, then it's, it's your responsibility as, as part in a, in a merger investigation to say, well, this is, uh, this is where the concerns are. Let's engage to find solutions here. Um, and, and I think part of the debate that we have had uh, afterwards uh, uh, actually ought to take place looking at the, the um, uh, Alstom Bombardier merger that worked very well because concerns were remedied and that created quite an amazing uh, company. Uh, also because these are complex matters. When, when, we, uh, when we ask companies to be challenged and to accept the challenges. And actually Peter's example of, uh, of Airbus is a very good example of a pro-competitive merger because we were back then, they, they were back then in a situation where there was very little competition. So when we ask for businesses to accept to be challenged, of course that gives us a responsibility to make sure that this is a fair challenge that we're dealing with unfair challenges. And exactly the question of, of foreign subsidies coming in, uh, disturbing public procurement, disturbing the single market, uh, enabling acquisitions uh, on unfair terms. I think that is one of the important things to, to say to businesses when we ask them to accept to be challenged in the marketplace in order to innovate more, in order to uh, serve their customers more. I think that is really important. And, and the white paper that we published last year got a very substantive, uh, very positive response from all sides of the debate, not only from business, uh, but also from scholars, from lawyers, actually also from, from uh, civil society. Uh, so now we are pushing ahead, uh, hopefully uh, with a legislative proposal uh, in, within the next uh, three to four months. And the point here is to say that uh, in Europe we have state aid, but state aid that is transparent, that is controlled, that is never more than what is necessary and always proportional. And that competition distortions, they are remedied. And this is exactly why we cannot accept uh, if foreign subsidies are coming in, maybe even picking up operating costs of businesses operating in Europe or coming in or allowing an acquisition at a much higher price than anyone who would have to compete in the marketplace would be able to pay. Or for businesses in public procurement, see themselves outcompeted because foreign taxpayers actually pay up uh, part of the bill. So, so this is part of the answer, but obviously it's not all of the answer because unfortunately there's, there's not a silver bullet here. Uh, it has to, to, to relate also, of course, to trade policy to the uh, trade defense mechanisms uh, that are in use, for instance, in the steel area, and of course, also for the border adjustment mechanism to come. On top of that, in order just to show what a complex world we live in, we just have now the comprehensive agreement on investment with China. And that again, of course, is to make sure that uh, out there in the world, we want to enable also European businesses to do business in the best possible may way with a certain level of reciprocity. Because what is in that Chinese uh, agreement to a very large degree is to enable uh, 
uh, market access to the Chinese markets, uh, level playing field uh, and sustainable development. Of course, everything in such an agreement is in its implementation and its use. But I think it's, it's, it shows our willingness to make sure that not only the European marketplace, as attractive as it is, is a fair and open one, but also that we do what we can in the global marketplace. Uh, I have a, a high level uh, digital dialogue uh, with uh, Chinese counterparts. And this is indeed to be able uh, in, in a continuing dialogue to address some of the issues where we have things to, to work on together, but also to be able to address issues where we disagree. Uh, and I think that is really uh, important uh, because we are in, in, in very uh, difficult geopolitical waters uh, these years. And, and it is important that we maintain and use the drive from competition to not only recover from the present crisis, but also to get the best possible and digital solutions out there. And here without competition as a driver, we would be missing out on so many things, uh, innovation as the most obvious one. So we are, we are puzzling, puzzling uh, this uh, together uh, in order for a, a pro-competitive uh, response exactly in this somewhat uh, toxic geopolitical environment. Yeah, indeed, Margarita. And I think you, you get help from the member states. Uh, we see more foreign investment screening, for example, over here in Germany, which is maybe yes. also part of the strategy uh, in, in, this, in this context. Okay, let's turn to big tech uh, a little bit, how to, how to tame the tech giants uh, in Europe and across the world. Isabel, you have the first question. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, so, Margrethe, during your, your first mandate as commissioner, you, you tackled some very important uh, competition cases uh, dealing with digital platforms. And we are expecting in the next few months maybe a decision on the Google Shopping case. Uh, so we will see what the, what the court decides on that. And you have also spent time in uh, trying to answer the question of whether there was uh, something missing in the regulatory framework or the competition law as it is applied with the report by your digital advisors. And now as an executive vice president, you have started trying to fill uh, what was missing. And uh, so uh, at the end of last year, you, you presented a very important package with the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. And I think that uh, the, the DMA will be maybe the, the number one topic for the competition world in the, in the coming year. So I would like to, to ask you a, a simple question. What do you expect uh, the DMA to, to bring to the commission in terms of added capacity for intervention that you uh, did not have with the traditional tools? And also, do you feel that there, there could be a, a role for national competition agencies to, to intervene in the DMA? Because uh, as the, the project is today, uh, it is mainly a tool that will be uh, used by the European Commission. So do you feel that this is something that might uh, evolve in the discussion about the project? And maybe finally, uh, do you expect that uh, this important uh, regulation will be adopted uh, within maybe this year or the beginning of next year? Or is it too uh, optimistic to think that uh, the, the, the project could move forward so fast, so to say? <laughs> No, you're right. Uh, it is fast. Uh, and I very much hope that, uh, that we can pass it uh, during the French presidency next spring. Uh, I think that would be, you know, showing uh, businesses doing business in Europe, European uh, customers, that, uh, that, we, that we mean business. That Europe is open for business, but on fair terms. Uh, because this is the gist uh, of the digital markets proposal. Uh, you know, I have seen from the casework, not one, not two, three Google cases. We are now uh, on the third Amazon case. The first one settled, the next was stigma of addiction, the third one opened. We have a number of Apple investigations. Uh, we have renewed uh, investigations into the Google ad universe, same for Facebook. And, and yet we have come to, to realize that we need more uh, because no matter how how fast we do our investigations. And, and you know, just as well as I do, that we can never compromise on due process. Uh, so there is a limit as to how fast this can happen. 
that we, we need uh, sort of also the ex ante approach. So before the harm is done, uh, to bring some order in a marketplace where there has been a lack of, of responsibility coming with the power that has been achieved. Because one is more than that more than welcome to be successful in Europe. If people like what you do, you become successful. But, but with success comes power and with power comes responsibility. And, and uh, if you look at the Digital Markets Act, you will see that once uh, designated as a gatekeeper on objective criteria, uh, the obligations and the prohibitions to a very large degree mirror what we have learned from the competition cases uh, and from we have learned from market investigations. So uh, in, in that respect, uh, of course, it's a reflection uh, of what we have learned over recent years. But one of the other things that we have learned is, of course, the need for a dynamic approach. So we, after the public consultation uh, on the uh, new competition tool, we took that and we made that a new digital competition tool. So we folded it into the Digital Markets Act in order to have this dynamic approach to be able to do investigations. And I th think that in particular here, uh, it's really important that we have this good interplay with the national competition authorities uh, and the European Commission. Obviously, uh, national competition authorities will continue doing 101 cases, 102 cases, um, where things are not covered uh, by the Digital Markets Act. For the Digital Markets Act in itself, since we're, we're dealing with things that have a European scope and businesses that are also, uh, well, very often global in, in their scope, I think the specific enforcement uh, should be European as suggested, but I think it's really important that we have this interplay. Uh, also because it is, it is likely that as things develop, there can also be a, a national investigation looking at, well, what is actually needed uh, for businesses to play a competitive role in this marketplace. And uh, we're also asking for, for three uh, national competition authorities uh, together to say, well, here, an investigation is indeed needed uh, if the Commission has missed a beat. Uh, and also, and, and that reflects the very positive experience I have with our advisory board uh, on, uh, on competition cases before decisions uh, are taken, that we basically uh, replicate that in the structure as to how the Digital Markets Act uh, should work. And, and I think that sort of takes uh, the best of, of inspiration from our our co collaboration uh, and reflects the insights that we have had uh, over recent years. And the sense of speed, and I know you share this sense of, of urgency. It's like a, it's a wake up call with no snooze. This is now. And, and this is why I have great expectations of the many, many competition authorities who are working so closely with member states in the council uh, preparations uh, in, in this first reading uh, that has started because I see how uh, national competition authorities are at the table being part of shaping uh, the process. It's a very high priority for the Portuguese uh, presidency uh, and with the speed that the council is working right now. And I see that very much uh, thanks to the engagement of national competition authorities. I think it is possible to push this and to have a decision during the French presidency also because the European Parliament is so engaged. Uh, the proposals were very positively um, uh, accepted, uh, of course, lots of ideas as well, but there is there's an enthusiasm uh, that they have not seen before uh, for, for these proposals, for this reform, for this comprehensive new single European rulebook uh, actually to take place for businesses doing business in Europe and for European consumers to have the benefits of fair competition also in these giant big digital markets. Thank you, Margrethe. I think this is very encouraging and I, I do feel there is a possibility to, to, to succeed, to, to complete the, the discussion uh, in the French presidency. And as you say, I think that the, the Portuguese presidency is doing a wonderful job and that uh, if we keep the right pace, it is something that can be achieved. And, it is not a small achievement because uh, the, 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 the issues are very complex. So that would be great to, to achieve that. So Andreas, up to you. Yeah, thank you, Isabel. Well, 
I believe that the role of the national competition authorities within the framework of the DMA maybe needs some more discussion. Um, I mean, we have a uh, we have a saying by the Deutsche Bundestag uh, that national competition agencies shall be included uh, into this debate, uh, and uh, we have just amended our law over here in Germany with with regard to taming the big techs. Um, so my question is going towards uh, Mr. Altmaier. Mr. Altmaier, we have all been watching carefully the dispute between Google and Facebook with the Australian government. Um, I mean, that was really astonishing what was happening uh, in Down Under. Rod Sims, my, my colleague from the ACCC in Australia, will later on report on it. Um, it was, they, they, it was about a law that would make uh, online platforms pay for sharing news content. Uh, with regard to the re reaction of Facebook and, and Google, there was a headline in the Financial Times that said, a big tech is trying to take government's policy role. Some said, uh, we should worry more about who's sitting in the boardroom uh, of these big tech companies than who's sitting in the parliament and, and in the government. That reminds me very much of some auto liberal approaches many, many years ago, decades ago, which said, be careful that big companies don't become too powerful. One of the reasons for German competition law in order not to give them too much political influence. So my, my question to you, Mr. Altmaier, are we there already? Do they have too much political influence? Um, and do you think what is happening over here in Germany with the amended law you have just mentioned with the DMA at the European level, do you think that we're doing enough? Or later on, we have a panel on, on asking if we had to break up these tech giants, do you think we need to go to, do you think we need to do more? Well, Mr. Mund, um, it's a very complex picture. Uh, and it's, um, it's a kind of, um, of a normal setting because it's all about uh, money, monopolies, influence. Uh, Google and Facebook uh, are parties um, in that competition, but not the only ones. Uh, and when you look at this um, at this dispute, um, where um, in Australia, like as in Germany and many of the European countries, uh, we have also uh, lent our support to our media companies uh, in Germany, uh, the publishers of newspapers, for example, and other media content uh, in order to strengthen their position. Uh, Google, uh, Facebook wants to strengthen their respective uh, position. Um, and, it, when it, and when it comes, and when it comes to, the, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the concrete issue, and of course, Google is arguing, uh, why shall I pay uh, when I uh, spread uh, um, uh, and, and make publicity um, of, of the media content uh, of a German, French or Italian uh, company? The companies are saying, no, we have produced the content and Google is earning lots of money uh, because it's becoming interesting uh, for advert uh, advertising uh, from all over the world because it has this big um, uh, anchor uh, function when it comes to the, um, um, to the access uh, to such uh, content. So this is um, something where it comes down, as far as I'm concerned, always to the issue, is there enough competition? Is there a choice? Um, or uh, do we have a platform uh, or an, even a media company or another company with such an overwhelming um, economic uh, overweight um, that it can uh, uh, put out of function the normal rules uh, of, um, of competition. And this is something where when I'm engaged in talks with Google, Google is a company that has done and is still doing a lot of good uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the World Wide Web, uh, and uh, it has introduced new services. Uh, Google Street View was one of the first, many others have followed. Um, uh, it, is, it is liked and loved by, 
by young people around the world, but at the same time, you uh, as a custodian of um, competition have to make sure that they do not become lazy and hypocrite um, and um, that they cannot dictate the rules to others. Uh, and therefore, it's in our interest to generate more competition. And if we, um, and if we cannot achieve that, then you need the tools uh, to stop practices that you would consider as incompatible uh, with our um, 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 social um, um, market uh, um, uh, economy. Um, my impression is that so far, neither in France, nor in Brussels, nor in Berlin, any company uh, can uh, decide on what politicians, prime ministers, ministers of the economy, commissioners, uh, and uh, presidents of Bundeskartell Amtes uh, would have to do. We have managed quite well to defend our independence. And as long as we are successful with that, uh, I believe in the future of uh, global competition. Thank you very much, Mr. Altma. A lot of responsibilities um, for competition agencies. Isabel, one uh, very short question uh, still with regard to including sustainability maybe into a competitive assessment. Yes, um, I will just say that um, I fully concur with what Minister Altmaier just said about the fact that uh, institutions, agencies and governments remain independent and take this uh, digital policy role very seriously indeed. So I would like to ask a final question to Margaret about uh, sustainability because it is a new topic that has been uh, discussed quite a lot uh, in the past few years now. Uh, one issue is that there is a, uh, an uncertainty about whether competition law could in one way hinder some positive developments that some industries might uh, uh, take into account to, to help climate change. So this has been one of the, of the ideas in the debate that, that maybe this should be clarified. And the European Commission is now opening a debate uh, as part of the European Green Deal. So maybe you could tell us about um, how you see the, the, the way to, uh, should it be adapting competition law or only clarifying some cases in which uh, for example, the industry could cooperate without reaching competition law. So that, that is one, uh, one thing. And uh, is there a risk if, uh, for example, sustainability is taken as a free pass to, to, uh, to be outside of the competition law rules? Uh, is there a risk of weakening competition policy? Uh, is there a risk of introducing an element that might be perceived as political or not as uh, objectively uh, uh, easy to, to take into account as other elements. So my, my question to, to Margrethe is uh, what do you intend for the next few months with this uh, Green Deal initiative and what can we expect from the European Commission on that front? Well, this is, um, I, I find this in, intriguing and, and interesting and, and important. Uh, because basically uh, fighting climate change is about uh, how we live on this planet. So it is, it is crucial uh, and, and also here, uh, I think most of us has a sense of urgency. Uh, things need to be done. The, and, and the good thing is that no one really questions uh, that the green transition should be the European growth strategy. Uh, neither than the rebuild after the crisis should be uh, focusing on the green transition, the digital transition and, and resilience. So there is a lot of ownership uh, in civil society, in the business community, uh, in, uh, in governments and, and parliaments uh, all over Europe and, and of course spreading uh, on this planet. Actually quite impressive uh, that year and a half ago when, when we uh, sort of set the European uh, strategy for being climate neutral, 2050, Europe was the first. Uh, and now you have, you know, one jurisdiction after the other coming on board uh, for climate neutrality. Uh, and this was uh, one of the reasons why I, I launched uh, this debate about how can also uh, competition law enforcement uh, play a role. 
My starting point is, is the obvious, that competition in itself is an enabler uh, for fighting climate change. Uh, because competition provides the needed driver for innovation. Uh, competition allows uh, prices to be uh, competitive. Uh, we have had competitive tenders now for quite some time uh, in, for instance, a number of renewables. So now you both see a uh, solar panel installation with no subsidies. Uh, you see also offshore um, windmill, uh, wind farms uh, with no subsidies. And, and all of that has come because using the powers of competition to drive down prices so that we can do more uh, when it comes to greening or that taxpayers can get it uh, cheaper than they would otherwise have had. And of course, with well-functioning markets, you also get sort of the pressure to have a, an efficient use of, um, of resources, uh, which is also, of course, essential when it comes to circular economy. Obviously, competition law enforcement is a subcontractor. Uh, the main thing here is, uh, is for the legislature to set the framework. Uh, and within that framework, uh, competition can play a role. Uh, so it is first and foremost for, for, for legislators uh, to say, well, these are the climate targets. Uh, this is the uh, rules for circular economy. These are the rules for animal welfare. These are the rules for biodiversity, you know, the entire package. Uh, which they do. Um, I think that we can do a, a number of things though, um, but important to discuss it first so that we get it right. Because we would, for instance, accept uh, efficiencies if presented with some that we can sustain. But the debate here is that if we should also accept sort of out of market efficiencies, that efficiencies is only for some con consumers or customers, but everyone will have to pay for it. Uh, on, on that specific, um, at least I'm, I'm still open uh, for input in, in that debate. Second is that we would be more than happy to provide guidance uh, for cooperation among companies as long as it's pro-competitive. Uh, and I think that's a really important point. Uh, I think the, the IPCIs is a good example of that. That is, of course, much more extensive uh, than, uh, than giving guidance. Because here, member states go in, uh, crowd in private funding. The, the important project that, that uh, Peter mentioned, uh, 3 billion, uh, give or take, of public funding, crowded in 9 billion of private funding with, with a very sort of good governance framework and for the knowledge created to be um, uh, distributed uh, in, in the, the relevant um, sectors. And, and here, a reaction. Uh, to enable the production of, of cutting edge uh, or the invention of cutting edge batteries because that the market will not provide that by itself. And I think that is also part of the answer here that where we see market failure, we should be uh, able and capable and stepping in to enable member states uh, to do what was done here. I think you are perfectly right to say that there are risks, that there are risks for greenwashing uh, here uh, also. Uh, and, and this is why we uh, have not concluded yet, um, but we have a number of things uh, that we work on. For instance, the uh, energy and environmental uh, aid guidelines, uh, we renew them uh, this year. And uh, those, of course, will also have to play a role within decarbonization. Uh, so one way or another, there will be uh, decarbonization, energy and environmental uh, aid guidelines. I think we can do something, but I respect that we are a subcontractor. And, and for me, the important point is that we finalize uh, also the debate. And I thank all the many people who contributed uh, and also in the conference that we had on the 4th of February, because this is not something that we do alone. This is something that we need to, to do together in order to get it right. Thank you very much, Margrethe. Dalma, just very briefly, uh, usually competition and sustainability goes hand in hand. But of course, we could run into a scenario where it does not, where we have a concrete, a concrete um, conflict between the two goals. If that is so, is it the competition agency that takes the decision? Or is it a very political decision? Which one goes first? Uh, competition or sustainability and is this something we knew the ministerial discretion in Germany 
Would that be a case where the minister would be asked to take the decision? No, I would say, I would say it is uh, neither uh, the minister, and I regret very much, but um, in many cases, um, even not uh, the national competition authority um, uh, ensuring uh, a competition. Uh, it is, um, it depends on how legislation uh, is um, uh, uh, is uh, composed um, and whether competition can be used uh, to achieve um, uh, politically um, important goals at cheaper prices. For example, uh, we are all we have a large consensus in Germany uh, that we can achieve carbon neutrality by the instrument of uh, CO2 and carbon pricing. Uh, because when we say, okay, um, every two years uh, we will increase the price uh, of carbon, then we will uh, provoke more innovation because companies would like to reduce the financial burden. They would like to reduce their costs um, and then they are competing for the best um, uh, solution. So that means you have um, uh, uh, less problems um, to resolve, we have less problems to resolve. But the point that you have raised is uh, much more important. Um, uh, it is um, about the question, how is competition taking place on international, um, uh, on, on global uh, scale? Because if we are deciding legislation, um, adopting legislation, uh, in favor of climate neutrality and we increase the cost per unit uh, of steel, car, uh, aluminum and others by saying, okay, carbon um, uh, emissions, uh, CO2 emissions have a price uh, and um, you can no longer externalize your cost, you have to internalize it um, and then, of course, you can you can have uh, two steel producers, one in Italy, one in Germany. The same rules apply to to both of them, and then they compete. Both are internalizing the cost uh, in, instead of uh, further externalizing the cost. But then, when you are competing with a steel company in Russia, in Brazil, in China, uh, where a similar legislation does not exist. Uh, and then the company still externalizing the cost at the expense of the environment, at the expense of the climate, would have a competitive advantage with a visa company uh, um, uh, obliged by European and national legislation to inter internalize its cost and uh, to better protect the climate. That is the challenge ahead of us. And therefore, and therefore, I believe um, you will still have uh, all your um, uh, authority and all your powers to make sure that uh, uh, companies uh, are not uh, uh, competing uh, in other, uh, uh, are not misusing uh, competition rules in other areas. But when it comes to climate change um, and energy transition, uh, then of course we have to make sure that on an international level, um, uh, the neutrality uh, is guaranteed. To give you an example, uh, we have the um, tool of IPCI uh, to promote new technologies um, uh, in order to, to make sure that a transformation from a gray steel emitting lots of CO2 becomes possible to the production of green steel without any net emission of CO2. So we could have climate neutral steel, climate neutral chemistry. That's all possible today using the most modern techniques. And we could give an incentive uh, by helping um, CAPEX uh, to be financed in order uh, to allow that transformation. But then a ton of green steel would probably be 30 or 40 percent more expensive than a ton of gray or dirty steel. And the question is how to cope with that. Um, and um, 
therefore the commission is engaged uh, in, um, um, uh, in, in ideas and in plans uh, to propose a border uh, adjustment mechanism. Uh, we are discussing this in Germany as well. I have invited um, German companies. Um, the, uh, the echo and uh, the comments uh, are diverging um, when it is uh, about a company uh, or a industrial branch emitting lots of CO2, then they are in favor of the EU Commission's uh, border adjustment mechanism because otherwise they would probably not survive. And if the um, company is a service company uh, not producing CO2 at all, then of course uh, it would be rather reluctant uh, because uh, there would be a fear that other regions in the world would respond uh, with protective measures themselves. So the answer and the solution is, can we achieve a global level playing field? And the fact that Japan has committed to the main elements of the Green Deal and climate neutrality uh, by 2050, the same is true for South Korea, and the new Biden administration uh, is now, is now, um, uh, has now decided to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, I will have uh, bilateral talks uh, with John Kerry as soon as possible, uh, the new climate representative. Uh, and if he could invite the Americans to join our Green Deal uh, uh, ambitions, then I believe there would be a chance of achieving a level playing field that would make life much easier for Margarete, for you, and for myself. That's the perfect word at the end, Mr. Altmaier. Um, in view of time, we have, have to come to a close. Uh, we're still having two great panels. I thank you both, Margarete, Vice President Vestager, uh, Mr. Altmaier. I thank you, especially Isabel, for being with me. Please, uh, our, our audience, stay with us. There's, uh, there's a great panel to come. Regulate them or break them up, the role of competition policy uh, towards big tech. Um, many thanks, and please stay with us. Bye, Margrethe. Bye, Isabel. See bye you bye. Soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, bye. 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 bye Andreas. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next panel, the panel on big tech uh, at the International Competition Conference. It's a bit, big, a bit as if the Rolling Stones had been just on stage and now there's this little singer songwriter, law professor from Dusseldorf trying to entertain you. Uh, but I have a fantastic band with me who at least have the energy of ACDC or some, some comparable group uh, with uh, Christina Kafara, uh, Andrea Cuscelli, Monika Schnitzer, Rebecca Slaughter, and and I guess Philip Steinberg will join us in a second. And we will also have a, an intervention by um, Rod Sims from Australia. Um, as Andreas Mund has just said, the topic of our panel is, or the question of our panel is, regulate them or break them up. Um, so my understanding of this alternative is there is either regulation or breaking them up. So if you, um, dear listener, um, are a representative of a big GAFA company, of a big digital gatekeeper, Google, Amazon, Facebook or something, you either take your blood pressure pills now or maybe you go for a walk for one hour and return um, because this will probably be dissecting your bad behavior and uh, telling you what we have in stock. But before doing so, I thought we'd give them a little better, cozy, comfortable time. And Rebecca Kelly Slaughter, I thought I, I give a personal question to you. I hope you allow me to. Um, you're the acting chairwoman of the Federal Trade Commission in the United States. You are known as someone who is out, outspoken on the, on the threats of big tech. Uh, the FTC has been critical of some of the practices. Um, but maybe you can disclose to us, just sort of to give these people a cozier time at the beginning, what do you love about big tech? Is there, is there anything where you personally would say, this is, really, this is really something that I really love about them? 
Way to put me on the spot to begin with, uh, but that's okay. I like the tough questions and I'm really happy to be here uh, and honored to be included. Uh, and of course, before I begin, I should note, as, as you said, I am uh, in the role of chairwoman of the FTC, but I remain one of uh, currently four commissioners. And of course, my fellow commissioners have their own strongly held views. So you should all take mine as my own views. And look, the way I would answer your question is the reason we have conversations about big tech uh, is that the services that they are offering have become integral, integral to everybody's lives, whether you're a small business, whether you're an individual. Um, we have seen I, there was a great series of articles in the U.S. a couple of years ago about um, a reporter who tried to eschew the GAFA companies from her life and, and not have any interaction with them and found it actually impossible to do. And so these are services on which we depend as, uh, as individuals, as members of society, as a parent, right? I have two kids in Zoom school right now, um, hopefully going back in person soon, but uh, currently using their devices to get their education. Um, you know, these are these are really material things for everybody. And that's why these conversations matter. You know, they matter because we want to make sure that when services and platforms become so integral to how we deal with the world, that they are treating their users fairly, that there are is an opportunity for real and meaningful competition and that they don't become social gatekeepers and societal gatekeepers in a way that is antithetical to a competitive democratic society. I think that was not really a love letter as I would have loved to get one, but okay, fair enough. Um, Christina, um, you're a senior consultant with CRA. You are known throughout the whole world of competition. Um, we've done competition with these companies now for mm -hmm. say 10 years or so. I mean, the, the Google shopping case, which is probably the most prominent uh, case that we've seen um, has been started in 2010. And I wanted to ask you, um, when, when we started this whole process, be it as enforcers, as academics, as people in governments, et cetera, we embarked on a, on a learning experience. I mean, we, we, had to, we had to grapple with the rather new phenomena, et cetera. But now this has been going on for a while. So we've been doing that for a while. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think are the key learnings that you've taken from approaching big tech? Maybe what have also been the key failures that we've seen, but what, how do you see this 10 years after, after 10 years? What, what's your sort of experience? What do you think is the key lessons that we have to take from that? Thank you, Ruprecht. Uh, again, a pleasure to be here. A word on disclosure, because I think it's necessary. Uh, I have advised address to Google, address to Facebook. I have done work for Amazon, for Apple, for Microsoft, for Uber and News Corp and many others over the years. I've also worked for governments, but I think it's appropriate to disclose whenever one speaks. So the question is, uh, is of course, uh, uh, interesting, what have we learned? Of course, the conventional wisdom that we've arrived to now is that somehow competition law hasn't quite delivered. Even after 10 years, the US experience is different because we all know that nothing has happened until very recently. But in Europe, indeed, as you mentioned, we have 10 years under our belt, shopping in 2010, and there is a sentiment that this hasn't delivered and that's why we're pivoting to regulation. My personal feeling is that this pivot to regulation is important and interesting, but it's not going to be a complete answer because uh, there is quite a lot of refinement that needs to be done. And in particular, we should make sure we don't lose in the process some of the good bits, some of the good learnings that we have uh, uh, taken out of competition law. I'm particularly fond of the specificity of competition law. I have some concerns that uh, the proposals that are on the table from the commission, for example, good as they are in principles, are aspiring to being a really general ex ante set of criteria with rules such as do not sell preference, which given the heterogeneity of business models that are underlying the digital economy are going to be difficult to be really applied in a way that makes a great deal of sense across business models. You need to be more specific. So I hope that this feature of competition law, which is the specificity, the understanding of the business model and getting into it, and then designing rules that are specific to it, 
uh, is going to find more of its way into the into the rules. And Andrea will talk to us about uh, this later, I'm sure. I think this is very close to the approach that the UK is taking in terms of codes of conduct that are specific to uh, individual platforms. So what have we learned and what has worked and what hasn't? I would say that there are three main areas in which I think there is a, a, a significant shortcoming, a significant gap in the way in which competition law is operating. Number one is an area where we actually would have the tools. We have the toolbox, except we didn't apply half of it. So my uh, view is that we tend to, of course, over-index massively on theories of exclusion and foreclosure just because of the comfort of the Microsoft background and the Microsoft precedent. We have all this foreclosure, we have all of this leveraging, but we also know that in tech, a lot of the concerns are about exploitation. We have the ability to deal with exploitation. It's in Article 102, but there is no real evidence that we're using that tool. We tend to use it for excess pricing. We haven't articulated how these exploitation theories really can apply to data advantages to other forms of concern. And that is not using the toolbox enough. There's another area where I think uh, the tools are there, but we are too timid and certainly need updating. And that's merger control, because we know that what has led us here, what has taken us to this enormous accumulation of power has been a succession of incremental acquisitions that we haven't even looked into, let alone uh, in any way uh, prohibited. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a major problem. We Do I need to say two words? Google Fitbit, I want to expand on that much more, but all of us who've been involved in various ways have been aghast at the way in which we heard the commission wasn't really able to tackle that given the current limitations of the way in which merge control operates. And there's nothing in the DMA, incidentally, for reasons I understand that takes us close. Third point and third area where I think the debate is super interesting now and it's getting interesting is this question that you put at the beginning. Should we contemplate breakups as opposed to the very urbane, very European way we've been going about it? Oh, no, breakups are a bit rude. We don't do that. It's too strong for us, right? We just do behavioral remedies because that's how, how far we can go. Now, uh, and that includes also breakups of if you like the vertical variety, the line of business restrictions, which I think is also one area of consideration, not just uh, sort of surgically dissecting something. And um, I hear a number of conversations in the US around this, which are extremely interesting and much further out that we in Europe have ever got to. Um, and that's also obviously a function of the fact that in the US there is a strong line of thought that one of the fundamental functions of uh, competition and antitrust is not just uh, to, to somehow uh, preserve contestability, but it's much stronger. It's distributing, redistributing economic and political power, making sure that private power doesn't become economic and political power particularly. And so this notion of redistribution of power really underlies much of the discussion on breakup. In Europe, we are more, you know, of course, coming from a different tradition, but we are certainly, uh, you know, coming close to being equally concerned about issues like uh, business models that are built on maximizing surveillance, maximizing addiction, prioritizing the most conflict-driven material, dark patterns, taking money from journalism, doing all sorts of things that are ultimately a concern for a much broader set. I knew, I knew I wouldn't be promising too much when I said we give them a harsh time now. And I see Rebecca is, is preparing to answer on the breakup questions in the US. But let me bring in Monika Schnitzer first, who's an economics professor in, uh, at Munich University. Um, and Monika, you're also uh, one of the top advisors of the German government in economic matters. Um, do you share the analysis of, of Christina Kafara generally? Or, or um, what is sort of your view of, these, of, the, of the past and now sort of the point where we are standing? I share this very much. And, uh, it's actually hard to come up with uh, additional topics, but, uh, but I have some. <laughs> so let me start by saying that uh, one problem we have with um, antitrust enforcement is that it's always ex post. And in the digital markets, we have now very fast moving markets. And this is why an ex ante approach actually makes good sense. And this is why the DMA perhaps makes really good sense because you come up now 
with um, ex ante um, rules that, that will uh, prevent companies to actually achieve this dominant position or to abusing their dominant position and then it's too late to really deal with them. Another thing that in the digital markets uh, we observe now is that competition enforcement is also difficult when uh, these companies always bring forward efficiency defenses and argue well actually they they uh, give away their goods for free consumers don't pay prices so our traditional thinking of too high prices don't apply here and we have too little understanding of theories of harm that are dealing with non-monetary prices so giving up your privacy and the way this is dealt with so far by asking consumers to give their consent to hand over their, their, their data, it just uh, shows that this is not the right way to solve the issue because um, consumers will always give their consent um, for behavioral re reasons, for, for lots of reasons. And um, that simply is not an, an option. Which brings me to this question of merger. I think really merger enforcement has been much too lax. And now the question is, why is that the case? Um, does the, the merger law not, not give the right um, yeah, power to actually go after these mergers? But like the Google Fitbit case shows the remedies that are imposed here. I'm very worried that they are not going to work because on the one hand, you have this consent question. And as I just said, I don't think consent is a useful or remedy to, to make sure that uh, nothing uh, bad is done. And on the other hand, you have uh, remedies that are um, yeah, really tedious to follow. So you have a regulation authority, you need a regulation authority that really follows all this. Now that again also brings me to the DMA. Um, a lot of things will have to be checked on a permanent basis. You need lots of staff. Actually, I don't think that the staff that is currently envisioned is, is, is enough to really deal with that. And this is why um, there's actually a much better solution, which is to some extent break up these companies. So prevent these mergers that afterwards then you have to control all the time, that the, the, all the remedies um, are really uh, followed. If you, if you prevent these mergers, then there is not much that you have to do afterwards. So in a way, it's a much more efficient um, way dealing with these companies. And therefore, I think um, a lot of um, lessons can be learned by looking back. So the, the Bell company, in which in the 80s was uh, broken up in, in the US, was exactly a, a showcase of seeing that regulation didn't work enough. So, I mean, that was a regulated company for decades. And in the end, uh, the, the uh, antitrust authorities realized that this was not working. It was not preventing all the anti-competitive behavior. And actually, in the end, then breaking them up led to a boost of innovation. So something the companies always say that they're so innovative. So please let us do because we are good for the world and for the consumers and everyone. In the case of Bell, we could see that um, in, our, in our research that after they were broken up, there was actually much more innovation. And therefore, I think that's not a good argument. Andrea Koscielny, um, we've heard the two economists, um, uh, scholars here on the panel, I mean, they can, they can talk like that, they don't have to do it. Uh, you have to, or you can do it at least. Uh, and actually, we learned that uh, just yesterday or today, you, you, um, you did a new case against Apple on the App Store, on questions of App Store, you opened that case at the Competition and Markets Authority, you are the chief executive, of course, everyone knows that, sorry for not uh, <laughs> repeating that in the beginning. Um, Andrea, you've, maybe you could tell us a few words about the new case, uh, not too lengthy maybe, but maybe more with a view to, um, if, you, if you listen to this, I mean, this is a case that you bring now 10 years after Google Shopping has been done, dealt with by the European Commission. Um, how do you approach this case? And will that probably possibly end up with a separation in, in Apple uh, App Store and operating system or so? Thank you. Well, let, let me just... Uh say a few words by way of context, and then I'm going to circle back to the case. I mean, I think for us, you know, our current strategy in many ways is quite similar to what Margarete was describing. So we are, you know, we have the current legal powers we have, which are about, you know, working on mergers, sometimes trust cases, we also have consumer protection powers. We're trying to do as much as we can to achieve results and impact with that. And one of the considerations there is very much what others are doing because a lot of these issues are international in nature. And so obviously I spent quite a lot of my time talking to my counterparts and trying to coordinate things. In parallel, we share very much uh, what Margarita was saying, what Christina 
has been saying, which is that, uh, and, and Monica as well, which is that antitrust and merger control is probably not enough given where we are today. And so we think there needs to be this complementary sort of exam, pro-competitive example regulation, which in spirit, I think is quite similar to the DMA or some of the changes that have happened in Germany. On the specific, there are some differences, but I would say many ways we're trying to do exactly the same thing. And certainly for us, you also had to put sort of Brexit and EU exit into this discussion, because essentially we are moving away from thinking very much the way, you know, Andreas and Isabel have been thinking, which is that a lot of the battles against big tech in Europe were done in Brussels, and there will be occasionally cases done in, in Bonn or, or in Paris, uh, but, you know, most of the heavy lifting will be done uh, in Brussels. We're now out of the EU, so what is important for us is kind of try to think strategically about what what is going to happen anyway in Brussels or you know what uh, Rebecca and her colleagues are doing or what the DOJ is doing and then what we can do on top of it so on merger control we historically uh, have been quite active in this area and we've always done a number of international cases but now we're essentially doing more cases together with others so, so Google Fitbit uh, we're not involved in because it was still done in Brussels a future Google Fitbit nine months from now, we'll be looking at it in parallel with others. If you bring it to antitrust and it gets slightly complicated, the way the withdrawal agreement for the UK from the European Union works is that there is a managed transition of cases, which in many ways is a very sensible way of doing it. So there are a number of ongoing antitrust cases and Margareta mentioned them uh, earlier today that include the UK market, will stay in Brussels and will finish. And in many ways, you know, it's great for me because someone else is doing work that would generate benefits for UK consumers who don't have to do it directly. But in parallel to that, we are kind of building our own complementary portfolio, thinking about where we can add value. And we launch a case against Google on, on, on Privacy Sandbox uh, in January. And the case we launched this week uh, against the Apple in relation to the Apple store is the second of this kind of category of cases. Now, there are Apple cases in Brussels. Um, this case is based on various complaints we have received that other agencies have received essentially about the way the Apple store operates. So both the, the guidance about you know, safety, privacy, various other considerations, payments in the Apple stores, the actual fees charged. So, we have decided it makes sense for us to open this case today, given our existing antitrust powers. Whether then next year we, uh, as I hope, uh, get the legal powers to also do exempt regulation or not, at that point we'll have to decide of all the cases we are doing our, under our existing tools, to what extent some of these matters uh, should be addressed more or with exam tools, which is the same consideration the European Commission and a number of national authorities will have to do if and when these new legal powers come into effect. But I think you know, it's very important if you are in my position that you kind of hedge your position a bit in the sense, you know, we have existing powers, there are things we can do. New legislation, you know, at the end of the day is for national parliaments to decide to exactly what is going to be in that legislation when it comes into effect, and so that's you know part of the discussion. So uh, you know, going back to the Apple case, uh, you know it's a new antitrust case. Uh, these cases take a long time, uh, but at the same time, you know they are important. You can get remedies, you can change business models. It's an important part of what we do, and to some extent, it's also a challenge for us in trying to do these cases quite quickly and quite effectively, which is hopefully what we'll be able to do now with this case. Thank you. Um, Philip, you are um, you're sort of uh, the outsider in this group, if I may say so. You are the director of um, economic policy in the German um, uh, Ministry of Economics, uh, and you are a lawyer and economist by training, so that is not putting you outside, but you are not someone from the core of the antitrust uh, competition community. Um, what's your, as a policymaker, what's your view of what you hear from, from us, say the group of competition people? Um, do you think we are sort of um, having the right priorities? We are setting the right paradigms or 
or I mean, you have probably other motives and ideas on your mind than just sort of we have this uh, we have this set of rules, say in Article 101 and 102 of the treaty, and we have the competition paradigm and the consumer welfare standard or something like that. How do you, how do you perceive this discussion that we that we lead? Do you think that's really a niche debate of of strange people who did not do their job well enough in the past years? Thank you, thank you, Ruprecht. I'm I'm feeling quite comfortable uh, amongst uh, you, and I'm learning learning a lot. But uh, but it's true, indeed. Sometimes, actually, when I'm I'm listening listening to this very sophisticated debates, be it of lawyers, be it of of economists, and sometimes I do think, actually, having heard like the same debates over years and years, that um, it's good that actually the debate has moved on considerably. And I still remember when I was in Brussels back um, back two years ago, a bit more, and I talked to the director general then, Johannes Leitenberger, and I, I, I told him, um, so listen, I think we need to change something. We need, we need new rules. And then it was very much uh, the same, a little bit what Christina was alluding to without uh, uh, wanting to do, do her, her harm. I mean, she, she was saying, listen, we can do everything with the, with the framework we have. We just, we just let, uh, let, to, uh, let us do it, and then we can do it. And I think this now, I'm, I'm happy that things have moved on because as a director general here in, in the uh, economics department of my ministry, obviously I care for competition. I care for fair competition. I care for, care for innovation. And I do think that we are, we are talking, and I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for, um, for the general guidelines of economic policy. We are talking about disruptive developments in the, in, in the economy, economy and the society. And for a long time, um, competition law and competition lawyers were kind of in their little boxes talking about their problems. And, and I had the feeling really that, that they didn't get the big picture. Things have changed. I have, I have to say, and the Commission and Margaret Vestager and, and, and our team, by now they have realized it, that actually we have to take this up. And because I think what is, is really important, and, and I think that the economist this, this week uh, framed, put it very nicely, saying that the idea of technolo the technology industry being dominated by monopolies has monopolized our thinking. And in a way, that was a little bit the case. It's like that, we cannot do anything against it. And so, so things have, have, have changed. And, and I think we can, we can see it here, even though sometimes I do think um, we should pay attention as important as those, let's say, debates about, about certain aspects are, we should not try to lose the, the, the big uh, picture. And then to conclude here, I mean, but, but I think, and there is, as, as always, and I'm from the economics ministry here, so we always try to equilibrate uh, things between other ministries and um, bringing the, 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 the reasonable voice of the of business community into, into the play. I think it's not either or. It's not ex post or ex ante regulation. You can do something in between. Yes, we do need ex ante regulation. Yes, we, we need ex post competition law, but I think we need a new generation of competition law. And I think that's what we have been trying to put forward. Minister Altmaier mentioned it in the first uh, uh, panel and, and he said, he said like, this is this, this our, our, our um, re reform of the German competition law, which, uh, which I think was, um, was quite important actually to get things going um, and it has been taken up. It's not an either or, it's not an ex post or ex ante instrument. It's sometimes I say it's a hybrid instrument because it con it's yes, it, it contains clear rules which can have an ex ante effect, but it has enough flexibility like it has enough possibility to consider each individual case, each justification. We need the comp competition authority of the Bundeskartellamt with its wisdom to actually apply it. And I think that's, that's actually what we believe and we hope, which is a good compromise between the two worlds. Um, Rebecca, uh, Philip just said things have changed a lot and they've certainly changed at least from a European perspective in the United States in the past year. Um, I wanted to ask you, how would you rate um, the probability that there is a breakup of big tech, of one big tech firm in the next 10 years or so. Give us a percentage point. Uh, what, what would your estimate be? Or do you see that coming uh, realistically, a breakup of one of these companies that we're talking about? Well, to be clear, in December, the Federal Trade Commission filed a lawsuit against Facebook specifically requesting a breakup as a remedy from the federal court. And since I have enormous confidence in our staff uh, and in the uh, quality of the work that was done in that lawsuit, again, in partnership with 48 states 
and localities, uh, I'd put the probability is very high because I think our likelihood of success on the merits is very high because I think we built a really compelling case. So I think that that's an important thing. There were a couple folks that, that there were a couple points that um, the esteemed panelists made that I'd love to pick up on if it's okay with you, sure. Ruprecht. The first is this question of ex ante versus ex post. And I just wanna put a little spin on it because um, I don't think it is entirely true that enforcement is all ex post and regulation is all ex ante. That is generally true, but right now, merger control, effective merger control, is ex ante work, right? The good merger control prohibits bad consolidation from happening. And so that's not just ex post, the kind of ex post conduct enforcement that we might have. And applying regulation now to large monopolistic companies is in a way ex post enforcement. So uh, I think we have to think about these things not entirely in this um, dichotomy between ex post and ex ante. And the other point I wanted to make uh, is about this question of breakups versus regulation. Um, I echo the views that I've heard by others that these are not mutually exclusive topics, right? You can think about both and they are fact specific questions. I agree with the points that Christina and Andrea made about um, you have to look at specific business models. There is not one size fit all, fits all for any of these questions. Facts matter, details matter, the economics matters, and the business model at the end of the day really, really matters. When we're thinking about breakups, to me that comes into a couple different categories. On the one hand, there's are we unwinding mergers that have already happened or acquisitions that have already happened? That's what the uh, FTC's Facebook lawsuit seeks to do. But not all of the growth in all of these companies is as a result of mergers, right? So you have, again, this is why business models look different in different situations. And Christina also talked about um, breakups in the concept, not just of unwinding mergers, but enforcing structural separation along vertical integrations that, that may not be the result of mergers. So I think uh, we have to be careful when we're talking about these things to sort of delineate it a little bit more clearly. And then the, the final point that I'd make is, I've talked about this with Christina before, and I think it's really interesting, this notion that in Europe, the idea of a breakup as a remedy to an enforcement action being something of a radical concept. In the US, Structural remedies are the sort of small C conservative approach to enforcement because they don't require ongoing government management of a behavioral condition. So it is cleaner and clearer and requires less heavy hand of government to, uh, to enforce a structural separation. Now, I don't think of myself as someone who um, is small C or large C or any other C conservative. Um, that's, that's not my political positioning, but I think it is important to understand that it is not a radical leftist concept to say that we should default to structural separation. I think it's actually something of a very conservative concept and one that has been embraced by conservative scholars and enforcers before. So, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. And then the last point that I'll make is whether we're talking about behavioral conditions or structural remedies, the point of enforcement is to be effective. And so there's this sort of general adage that you can't enforce breakups because you can't, it's too difficult to unscramble the egg. But in many cases, actually unscrambling, unscrambling, uh, a consolidated company may be much easier than imposing complicated behavioral conditions that have to be administered on an ongoing basis. In other cases, that may not be the case. But what we need to be going for as enforcers is actual remedies that are administrable and solve the competitive problem that we have identified. Um, that's and, and that may, I think that that tends to be structural. It may also include a behavioral element. Um, sorry, I said that was the last point. The final point that I'll make is in the U.S., this question goes both in terms of what are enforcement agencies doing and then what is our legislature doing from a policymaking perspective. And those two things, again, are not mutually exclusive. There has been really active, robust activity in 
Congress in the United States doing investigative hearings, producing reports, proposing legislation to address some of these problems. Uh, and that's going to be that's going to be a continuing conversation that I think is only getting more active and closer to um, I don't know whether you call it a finish line or a starting line, but it's going strong. Uh, and and that's not something that we as enforcers are going to wait to have happen to do the work that we think is important and in front of us right now. But we are mindful that that may change the playing field on which we are operating. I have two very short questions uh, picking up on what Rebecca said. Uh, to, one to Philip, one to Andrea, please, with a short answer. Uh, Philip, uh, structural remedies, um, divestitures, is that something that you will negotiate into the DMA after hearing what Rebecca Slaughter just said? Yeah, I think I think that's one extremely important point. So we are, we, are, we will certainly um, have a positive look at it and and probably uh, embrace it. Even though obviously we have not, uh, uh, we still are in the process of actually making up our mind and coordinating ourselves in, within our group of the friends of an effective DMA. Excellent, Andrea. Uh, another issue. Uh, Rebecca was um, uh, Rebecca was uh, be very confident in in, in the courts. And and I wish to pick up a question that Peter Freeman put to us before this panel, uh, whom you obviously know very well. And he said, maybe I'm reframing what he said, but he said, maybe the courts are the problem in Europe. And, and should they maybe have a lighter sort of touch of judicial review? Uh, we don't really know what the European Court of Justice will make out of the Google cases, uh, for instance, and uh, proceedings are very long. I see Christina Kafara nodding her head when I start <laughs> discussing courts. Uh, what do you think is the right level of judicial review in such cases? Well, I think it's, it's a very important question, because in a sense that the regime delivers through administrative agencies and courts in Europe. Most of the big cases go through the courts. Uh, I mean, if you think about merger control, the judgment by the general court on the mobile merger in the UK between three and you know, two, uh, in many ways, I think is a difficult judgment for, for the European Commission and a difficult judgment about merger control in general. I think one of the issues about merger control in digital is that it is complicated. There is an element of uncertainty. There is an element of complexity. And certainly agencies internalize uh, the expectations of what the courts would do uh, when reviewing some of these cases. And that's why we have been pretty open in the UK. And we have said that if parliament in, uh, legislates for our equivalent to the DMA, next year we would like also change the merger control just for the platforms that are designated as having strategic market status so essentially this gatekeeper status and essentially have a more cautious uh, standard of review for that uh, which i think again links to what rebecca was just saying about the level playing field because one of the concerns we have in terms of merger control is that you know you apply a case law which is based very much on much more static industries where, in a sense, you know, traditionally we blocked mergers where, you know, someone with a high market share would buy a big competitor. You look at what happened in the previous three or four years in those markets and it would be a very good proxy for the future. Um, you know, I, I read a book by a Bloomberg journalist looking at the Instagram acquisition by Facebook. And, you know, it's actually a very good book. It's 300 pages talking about a lot of the qualitative elements of it. And I think if you read a book like that and you think, you know, can we actually block this type of acquisition and go to court and fight on, you know, lots of documents, lots of evidence when there is genuinely uh, quite a lot of uncertainty about the business plans of some of these, uh, you know, uh, early stage companies and acquisitions. So I think that the, the role of the courts is very important as part of the overall ecosystem when we talk about big tech and when we talk about uh, where we are today and where ideally we should go in the next few years. I want to bring in the Australian experience at this point and Rod Sims, whom you all know as the chair and um, head of the uh, ACCC, the Australian Consumer and uh, Competition Commission, uh, sent us a video message. He's hopefully asleep now. Uh, and um, I would ask the uh, I would uh, ask our organizers, our hosts to sort of uh, present the video to us uh, so that we get uh, his views on the on the topic. Thank you. 
Thanks very much to Andreas for the invitation to speak today and Barbara for all the organisation and the Bundes Cartel Aunt for putting on this, uh, this wonderful conference. I'm sorry I can't be there live, but uh, you're putting on the conference uh, sometime between two and three o'clock in the morning in Sydney and I'm uh, happily asleep in my bed. As you all know, the ACCC's interest in digital platforms issues came about through our digital platform inquiry uh, that went through 2018, reported in mid-2019. Uh, there was a very wide terms of reference. We used our information gathering powers. And of course, we brought our expertise of being a competition enforcer, a consumer enforcer, and an organisation that regulates infrastructure and monopoly power or, or market power in, in general. A lot happening around the world in relation to digital platforms, which I'm sure you're going to hear throughout today. Uh, as we all re understand, the digital platforms have got an enormous amount of market power. They've got to the position they are because of partly innovation, partly an awful lot of acquisitions. The concern now is with their market power, are they indeed now damaging innovation and competition? Uh, they've got such market power that they are in a position where they can self-preference, they can have the ability and incentive to engage in anti-competitive behaviour, and that's why uh, we're having the discussions that we're having today. I think it's also important to understand that the digital platforms need to keep growing their profits. If their profits stayed at the current levels, their share price would more than halve. So they have a tremendous incentive to keep growing their profits, which given their strong market position can raise concerns that we're all interested in. I thought today I'd just share developments in Australia. Uh, I've got that under five headings. Uh, firstly, uh, I mean, we came out with 23 recommendations and a digital platform inquiry. They covered a whole range of areas. There's things going on in Australia about a privacy code with the digital platforms, a review, a more detailed review of our privacy laws, looking at a code in relation to misinformation and disinformation, and trying to align regulation between um, digital platforms in the online world and some others who operate in the offline world to make sure we don't have uneven regulation. They're all ACCC recommendations, but they're not issues that we are uh, particularly involved in. Uh, but as I say, they do owe a lot to our, our recommendations. Secondly, we have three enforcement cases before the courts. Uh, they involve essentially misleading and deceptive conduct in relation to how you turn off your Google location data, the combination of uh, Google account data with double click data, and uh, the privacy of information that Facebook gained through uh, Anavo, the Anavo app. So we think consumer cases can play an important role. Uh, we also have looked at various competition matters. A couple of things we were interested in have now been taken on by overseas regulators and we judged probably best to leave with them for the moment. But we are continuing to look at both competition and consumer enforcement matters. The third area we're looking at is mergers. We're uh, spending a lot of time looking at uh, completed acquisitions, uh, Google's acquisition of Fitbit, Facebook's acquisition of Giphy, and, face and of course the uh, not completed acquisition, Facebook's acquisition of customer. So they're important matters, but I think going on around that is the debate about whether there should be, uh, whether our laws can actually cope with uh, acquisitions by dominant players and there's an active debate that will grow increasingly in Australia about that and I know there's a debate about that around the world whether our merger laws can cope with acquisitions by dominant players. The fourth issue is that our monitoring work continues. We've got a lot of studies underway. Two areas we're looking at are the apps market which is obviously dominated by Google and Apple, and the ad tech market, which is obviously dominated by Google. And so we're looking at the implications of that market power. 
we're looking to see whether there's the incentive and ability to engage in self-preferencing or anti-competitive behaviour. We don't know where we'll end up in all that, but obviously there's the potential for enforcement action on the one hand, but also regulation on the other. I'm not saying we'll get there, but we're looking at a wide range of things that, uh, of outcomes that could flow from those reports. And finally, our news media bargaining code has passed our parliament. It is now the law of the land. In that, we've taken a different approach to Europe. Europe is very much a copyright, neighbouring rights approach. Uh, obviously, Isabel de Silva and the French authority took Google to court successfully for basically offering zero uh, payment to publishers, and that's been successful, and there's been deals done in France. The approach in Australia is very different. Um, we've looked at this from a market failure point of view, arguing that there's less journalism than you'd have in a competitive digital platform market. Our point is basically that Google and Facebook have placed themselves between news media business, businesses' customers and the news media businesses themselves. Um, basically, search is Google. Um, they are the internet in terms of social media. Facebook is effectively the internet. So they're in a very strong position. And our concern is that Google and Facebook need news media on their platforms. It helps them make more money, partly directly, but much more indirectly by keeping people on the platforms. Whereas Google and Facebook need news media, they don't need any individual news media company. And so there's a bargaining power imbalance. The way we've sought to address that is to have a negotiate arbitrate model. The ability to go to arbitration provides each news media business with extra bargaining power, extra leverage, so they can reach deals with Google and Facebook, which would be commercial deals that you'd expect in a competitive market. Whereas at the moment, without the bargaining code, that ability doesn't exist. And as a result, we'd get less journalism. Now, as I say, the code has passed Parliament. Uh, Google and Facebook have helpfully drawn a lot of attention to the news media bargaining code. Google, by threatening to end search in Australia, uh, closed down their ser search in Australia. Facebook, actually unilaterally, without any notice to anybody, uh, took not only news off their platform, but emergency services, health information, and a whole range of other things. Um, that's now thankfully restored. But because of both that threat and that action, uh, there is a lot of attention on the media, ba media bargaining code. But it is law. Uh, deals are being now negotiated between uh, Google and news media businesses and Facebook and news media businesses. We welcome that. The purpose of the code was to strengthen the news media businesses' bargaining power so they could get appropriate fair deals, commercial deals. That's happening. Uh, so that's the indicator of success of the code. Uh, we never wanted arbitration. We just wanted it there as a backdrop to even up the bargaining position, and that's happening. Jeffrey. If I could just finish up by making three final points. Firstly, we think dealing with digital platforms issues needs competition enforcement, consumer enforcement, but also regulation. Secondly, if I could address the, the question being posed by the conference, we're in the camp of regulation, not breaking them up at this stage because you're just unclear what breaking them up will yield, what it will lead to. We'd rather address the problems that are very much in front of us at the moment. And finally, all this is a bit of a journey. We're learning off each other. Conferences like this are so important, helping us do that. So thank you for inviting me to speak, and I very much look forward to what comes out of this conference. Thank you. Yeah, back, I, I, I guess. Um, maybe you can also restart your videos or... Uh, excellent, thank you. Um,
This was Rod Sims from the ACCC in, in Australia. And uh, when we look back to, to the experiences of Australia in the past weeks with Facebook and Google and the media cases, uh, I had the impression they are flexing the muscles and it is sort of difficult for governments to, to sort of react to that. Rebecca, is that something uh, from the US experience um, where you would say lobbying, regulatory capture, uh, those are issues that you have to be particularly aware of if dealing with big tech? I mean, you've worked for Chuck Schumer, the senator, uh, before, and, and I guess you were sort of uh, under pressure from different sites in that political role as well. Yeah, well, so that's what I was going to say. I worked in the United States Senate for a decade, so I'm very familiar with lobbying campaigns. Um, and I think that uh, it's what you expect anytime anyone is contemplating change, whether you're doing it as enforcers, as legislators, uh, change is hard. People can be resistant to it. And what is important for anyone working in this space is to make sure that they understand the facts with which they are dealing, the markets with which they are dealing, the law with which they are dealing, and then think about and keep a laser focus on what is the right thing for the people, the workers, the consumers that we as public representatives are um, not just empowered to, but obligated to protect. Uh, that's the oath of office that we take. And so that's what I take seriously. You know, everyone is entitled to make their views known and their opposition to change known, and that's fine. Um, but I think effective legislators and effective enforcers can distill between the noise and the substance uh, and really try to keep laser focused on the substance. Okay. Uh, Christina, a, a completely different question to you. Um, we are discussing this very strongly under the, under the heading of the GAFA companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and, um, and uh, many of the cases and many of the debates center around these cases. Are these companies, the GAFA companies, the ones we are talking about, maybe plus Alibaba and, and uh, one or two others? Or are we talking about smaller platforms um, as well when we are talking about regulation of digital gatekeepers? Where would you, I mean, what do, what do you think is the appropriate approach? Who should be covered by, say, the Digital Markets Act or activities in this field? Look, we need to do things uh, uh, in steps, right? I mean, we know that the main problems are associated with the largest, the largest digital platforms. And... Uh, although I don't exclude that there will be issues on a narrower basis in more limited platforms. And this is a dynamic market in which things, of course, uh, the old chestnut change all the time. I think we need to just start with dealing with that. I do not have at this point concerns about capturing other platforms. I think we have our work cut out. And I think we have our work cut out because there is persistent confusion, even around this. I mean, I don't know if you, you may have seen this, sort of the article in The Economist this week, which is extremely puzzling. I regret that a publication of this profile puts out an article that says, look, these giants are turning against each other. They are competing. Maybe markets are self-correcting after all. I, this is caricaturing it a bit, but a, 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 a small number of conglomerates kind of making forays into each other's space is in competition. That isn't what we mean by competition. So I think, I think to, to your question, we, we, we have been to, to beholden to the type one era. We really need to focus on these major platforms because that's where the majority of the problem lies. Uh, and let's see what the rest, uh, how things unfold. So if you, just one short follow-up, so if you would design the DMA designation of gatekeepers, you catch five companies or 10 or 20, what would be your preferred number of, of platforms that are designated as digital gatekeepers there? Well, look, the commission has got, is, is, is going in the direction of quantitative criteria because it needs to be seen to be doing things not ad hominem, right? You can't do a, a law for Apple, one for Google, one for Facebook. But, and so quantitative criteria is the way to go. And it's clear that the thresholds have been close, chosen quite carefully to capture all of the big ones, maybe a couple of Europeans, and maybe some are coming up, some of the Chinese are coming up, maybe TikTok. So I think that we have, as I say, our work cut out dealing with the largest one and trying to do the work, being specific enough and telling them, this is what's wrong with you. This is what you shouldn't be doing. And this is what you shouldn't be doing. And not just kind of generalized 
rules that I think will allow a lot of wiggle room because you know the answer is going to be yeah, that's for me. Do I do that? No. Um, so I think that that is the way to go. Okay. Philip, you uh, earlier um, mentioned uh, the group of friends of an effective digital markets act. Uh, I take it that was an invention by you, not a fixed group of allies that you're working with. I, I, maybe you can say a word on that. And we discussed structural remedies already. Someone reminded me that they are in the DMA, but they are obviously not at the forefront of the DMA. Uh, but, but what are your priorities when you go into negotiations now as in the council? Uh, what will Germany sort of push for? For in the Digital Markets Act. Uh, thanks, uh, Ruprecht. Uh, of course, no, there is a group. Uh, we, we have formed a group, of course, uh, uh, France, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, and, and Germany actually is uh, is lobbying or, or, or working for an, for an even better DMA. We are we are great fans of the, the Commission's proposal, but we do think that there, there are a couple of things which need to be thought over. First, of course, um, yeah, the, the question of gatekeepers, definition of gatekeepers. Yeah, we believe that it is good to have a European answer for that. But then the question is how to enforce it. And here, here I think it is important that we, we have a lot of trust in the commission and, and uh, Margaret Westhager does a great job as does um, and her team. And, and, and we are really, we are really, really grateful for, for their, their guidance. Still enforcement is an action, is, is, a, is a question. And we believe that enforcement should be a joint enforcement uh, between uh, shared enforcement between the commission and national competition authorities. We believe only in this, this way there can be effective enforcement of, of comp competition law of the new DMA in a multi-level system of governance, um, if I may say so. I think this is one of, uh, of our important uh, points. And, and second, of course, uh, as, as, as what I've already said, we need enough flexibility because obviously that's an ex-ante approach those uh, practices prohibited in, in the DMA draft right now, yes, we believe those are practices that shouldn't happen, or, but, uh, but we are not sure that this is actually, that, that can, it, it will be our, our wisdom forever, because obviously uh, things change so quickly in this platform economy with those companies, so we need to make sure that there is, uh, that there is enough, uh, uh, enough flexibility um, and um, uh, and this, this approach, um, um, of course, creates certain tension in terms of a flexi a flexibility, future proofness, fitness uh, for the complexity of the digital uh, e economy. And um, therefore, um, this is something we need to, to come to, um, come to uh, grips uh, with. Uh, and we will, of course, support the negotiations uh, in this way with our full, uh, full commitment. But the question of, you know, and, and Andreas Mund was making this point in, in, in another meeting, what is self-executing? You know, we always need somebody actually to make a decision. And we have all these very strict rules. I think we need this flexibility. There are no self-executing um, rules in competition law. And I think this is something we, we would like to, uh, to make clear um, without, of course, uh, putting into question that this is a good, good approach. But there need to be space, not only for co national competition authorities, also for national competition law, because as The Economist, once again, has actually underlined this, this, this week that actually we, we tend to have an oligopolistic structure and therefore it's not, it may, may, may not only be the big, big gatekeepers, but it might be a little bit more diffuse and we need to be ready to, uh, to answer, uh, uh, answer to this development to preserve fair competition and innovation. Thank you. Innovation, that's a good uh, keyword for Monika Schnitzer. I mean, you're an expert on that as well. And Monika, um, maybe you can say a word, and unfortunately it has to be a short word, um, uh, on, on the issue. Um, uh, are there chilling effects on innovation actually? I mean, this is the big concern that we that that many people put forward if we start regulating or breaking up or if we toughen um, merger control. Where would you draw the line or can you give us a very general idea, maybe a quick answer on how to draw the line so that we do not, um, or, or are you even concerned whether we sort of have chilling effects for innovation if we go into this field? I mean, a lot of people come up with this concern that, um, if we have uh, um, um, too much competition, that this will actually be um, working against innovation. I would argue the other way around. If you have monopolies, that works against innovation. I mean, they may have the tools, they may have the, the right information, they may have the money to do it, but they do not necessarily have an incentive to provide the best products. Uh, let me give you two examples. 
In the case of Bell, they had a huge monopoly. They had all the tools. They had a great lab and they invented the answering machine. They invented the cellular phone, but they didn't market these products because they were afraid of jeopardizing their own existing business model. And this only happened then after the breakup. Let me give you a very recent example now. In case of Google, for instance, we think that they benefit now from being very much integrated in all kinds of uh, services. And for the consumers, this is great. They get under one heading, lots and lots of different services. But the core business where they started out with gets worse and worse. So you look at the Google search results that you now see on your screen, and it's all ads. 10 years ago, it was generic search results. So that was something you thought, okay, they use my data and they give me great results. Today, they use your data simply to give you ads, but not the nice generic results that you really want to have. So it's not clear that monopolies really have the right incentives because as soon as they're not jeopardized anymore, losing market share, and this is what we are seeing right now, they don't have the right incentives anymore. Thank you, Andrea. The final question goes out to you. And I thought it, it's good to put a philosophical question to you uh, because uh, we don't have much time. So, so philosophical questions are best probably for the end. Um, and I wonder, I mean, this is the International Competition Conference. Uh, we have juris jurisdictions represented from all over the world, small agencies, etc. And I sometimes wonder, is this a very European debate or say a westernized debate or something like that um, or, or put differently what would be your advice as head of one of the leading enforcement agencies in the world to people working in say an African competition authority in a South American competition authority or so who maybe do not not saying they don't have the leverage power you have but but maybe maybe they have sort of less of a tradition uh, than than uh, some of uh, um, the European competition authorities have what would you what would be your advice for them dealing with um, uh, with uh, uh, the digital gatekeepers and this has to be a really short answer yeah. well i would uh, i think i think monica had great examples about the problems with monopolies so i think they should focus on dealing with their monopolies some of the monopolies in those countries are global monopolies and i agree with you it'd be quite difficult for them unilaterally to act but some you know if you think about food delivery apps these are the type of uh, markets where having two or three players rather than one in the market makes a big difference or uber uh, you know, having a competitor or two rather than being a monopoly. So I think even, you know, Egypt uh, had a big decision against Uber last year. So I think you had, even in, in you know, in smaller or in, 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 in agencies, they might struggle more to deal with the global platforms. There's plenty of, of digital uh, work that you can do that really directly benefits your uh, citizens and consumers. That was short and that was very encompassing. Thank you so much. Thanks to all five of you and uh, to Rod Sims, of course. It was a great discussion in my view. Thank you very much for your insightful comments and I hand back to Andreas Mund. Thank you. Thank you for moderating. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Ruprecht. Great moderation Thank as always. You. Well, um... Many thanks uh, to, to this panel. Uh, it was really great, I guess. And I take uh, one lesson uh, learned with me that is uh, it doesn't need to break them up. Maybe structural remedies will do, but I think this is something we really need to reflect about how to make more use of structural remedies in abuse cases with these big companies. That's one point. The other one is I really believe that we still need to discuss the role of uh, national competition agencies in the framework of the DMA. We have a fantastic system of cooperation in the ECM and why not transfer this to a certain degree uh, to the DMA, certainly something that needs to be discussed. Having said that, <clears throat> I turn uh, to our a short uh, welcoming uh, in, or introductory speech uh, by Christian Klein, CEO of uh, SAP. Uh, SAP is a German multinational uh, software corporation <coughs> based in Waldorf in Baden-Württemberg, specialized in business software. I think most of you uh, will, will know SAP. Christian Klein started his career at SAP in 1999 as a student and on April 20 in 2020, 
that can only mean luck to him. Christian Klein was appointed the sole CEO of uh, SAP at the age of 39. So I'm very glad he followed our invitation. I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Christian Klein for a short uh, welcome intervention from his side. Dear President Mund, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to speak to you today alongside with Minister Altmaier and Commissioner Vestager. Thanks a lot for having me. First, please allow me a short look back to where SAP came from. SAP is a European success story. Our company was founded here as a small regional enterprise in Germany. Since then, we have grown into a global player and the world market leader in enterprise application software. We did so with our own creativity, competence, our motivated and highly skilled workforce and without aid or funding from the government. Today we compete with the other global players, especially from the US and China. It's all about focusing on our customers' needs and concrete business benefits while building innovative products and technology. These are the ingredients that made us successful over the past 50 years. This is the DNA of SAP. Yes, we made some acquisitions. However, organic growth remains our main focus. More than 16% of our revenue is reinvested in research and development, where also almost a third of our employees is working. Let me be bold. Success stories like the one from SAP must be possible. We need to ensure opportunities for growth. In our ever-changing world, there will be always be industries or countries that are on the move. And while they are evolving, of course, they might need political attention to find a level playing field for hard but fair competition. This is essential to enable customers to choose the best solution. SAP is a global player from many perspectives. We make far more than half of our revenue outside Europe. Our more than 100,000 employees are from more than 145 nationalities. Our customers include more than 90% of the Forbes Global 2000 companies. As a matter of fact, SAP is the only European player competing with companies from the US and China on iLab. These days, we talk a lot about digital sovereignty. For me, this means being able to shape key technologies, business models, and ecosystems with global reach. Germany is an export nation, so digital sovereignty must not lead to isolation as growth in Germany is dependent from free trade in Europe and beyond. To ensure free trade and fair competition globally, we need a global framework that works for all nations. Indeed, excessive protectionism poses a threat to our growing industry and the economy overall. And yes, dominant market players that abuse their power must be put into place. At the same time, we need to ensure companies have opportunities for growth. Europe can only compete with the US and China if it acts as one. In the digital age, the law of competition on a European level should be compatible to those in the US and China. Collaboration is key. Global challenges will not be solved by single regions. Global challenges require global answers. Well, many thanks, many thanks to Mr. Klein. Uh, global challenges require the, uh, global answers. And I think that is true, not only for companies, that is also true for competition agencies. And this is why I believe it is so important to hold conference like this today, to have an exchange on, on questions uh, and, and to cooperate and to coordinate among us, be it in the OECD or be it in the International Competition Network, the ICN. Having said that, again, many thanks uh, to Mr. Klein, and we turn to our next panel that will deal with public policy issues. The question is pain or gain, the future of public policy objectives in competition law. Uh, Ingo Brinker, you have the floor. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Monte. Uh, good afternoon also from my side and a very warm welcome to the second panel of this wonderful conference. Um, um, taking the example of Ruprecht Potsdam, uh, who introduced uh, after the Rolling Stones, the AC and DC, uh, I would like to, to turn to Italian opera. Uh, and uh, I don't have only three tenors to offer. Uh, I have actually four. And uh, uh, a preeminent soprano on, on top of that, so a wonderful group of people on this uh, on this panel. My name is Ingo Brinker. I'm the chairman of uh, the Competition Lawyers Association. <laughs> Predominantly in uh, Germany, in Brussels, in Austria and in Switzerland, but with members all over Europe. Um, I'm personally very honored and I trust that uh, also the members of our association, they are very honored as well that uh, we are invited to facilitate the discussion among this outstanding group of uh, people who form the, the second panel. So we would like to broaden uh, the perspective uh, a little bit uh, from, from competition law to public policy objectives in addition to competition law, competition law enforcement, um, and uh, uh, also uh, the implications this might have on, on enforcement. Um, Executive Vice President uh, Commissioner Vestaya uh, confirmed that there is indeed a wide consensus, maybe a unanimous consensus in Europe on the policy of the Green Deal. And she reminded us uh, that uh, uh, competition plays an important role in this context, but that the focus is, is on the policies itself. Um, and um, we will all agree that uh, the questions on social security, on employment, on the climate change, uh, they are essential and need a proper and comprehensive uh, answer and strategy. And uh, Mr. Mund correctly stated that competition law and enforcement um, and such strategies typically go hand in hand, but uh, from time to time, it may be a little more difficult and a little more complex. And that's exactly uh, the point where we bring in this uh, wonderful group of people with a diverse background and broad experience um, who are able to address these complexities in, in particular. Um, all of the members of our panel, they have uh, initiated uh, studies, have published memoranda, have started consultations, have published uh, guidelines on the topic in particular on sustainability. And I would just like to, to take two examples. Uh, first, uh, DigiComp has finalized, not really finalized, but it started and collected uh, responses to a consultation on Green Deal and uh, a competition policy. And we will come back to that a little later. Uh, and in addition, um, and uh, perhaps I, I may say so, and I'm tempted to, to refer you uh, to the response that was prepared by, by my association uh, within the, the framework of, of this, uh, this consultation. And you will find that uh, both in German and in English on the website of the European Commission. And in addition to this uh, uh, topic, uh, I, I would like uh, to refer to, to the ACM in the Netherlands, in particular to, to Chairman Snoop, um, who has published recently guidelines on the topic of sustainability in the context of enforcing competition law. Now, let me briefly introduce my wonderful panel and uh, let me start with uh, Alejandra Palacios Prieto, the, the chairwoman of the Mexican Federal Economic Competition Commission and also the vice chair of the ICN steering group. Um, Mr. Temingosi Boyna Kehle, the commissioner at the Competition Commission of South Africa, uh, Director General Olivier Garçon from the European Commission in Brussels, um, Chairman Martin Snoop from the Netherlands Authority of Con Consumers and, and, and Markets, and finally Professor Achim Wambach, who is a Professor of Economics at the University of Mannheim and the President of the Leibniz Center of European Economic Research in Mannheim, and if I may add that, in addition, also the former Chairman of the German Monopolies Commission, uh, who is advising uh, the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and also the Bundeskartellamt on various topics of, of competition law. 
Um, we will start our panel and the discussions um, with uh, an introduction into the uh, subject with a broader overview over the topic of uh, public policy objectives in the context of competition law. And I'm very happy to introduce um, uh, Ms. Palacios uh, to you who will take the floor first. Ms. Palacios, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, is my microphone on? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, um, first of all, thank you, Andreas, for um, inviting me to this very interesting uh, conference and uh, for um, choosing Mexico uh, on its position on the future of public policy objectives in, in competition law. So, um, I'm very grateful, and um, <clears throat> it really gives me the opportunity of share the Mexican experience, um, which is very recent, regarding a very happy coincidence uh, in pursuing competition policy objectives at the same uh, time as pursuing other public objectives, uh, specifically um, environmental sustainability. So um, the overlap between these two areas of policy has, of course, attracted uh, increasing attention. And um, this event is a proof of this because they both pursue the welfare of, of present and future generations, although um, in the past they were at odds uh, with each other because uh, in the past uh, generation of um, electricity with renewable energy was more costly than it is to obtain now. Uh, now it's more costly to obtain energy with um, with uh, burning uh, fossil fuels. So when you talk of a, an efficient market, um, there's a coincidence between clean energy and, uh, and competition. And of course, the international experience of including sustainability considerations into competition policy and enforcement is taken um, several forms. Um, <clears throat> our moderator has, always, uh, has um, told us that uh, some of these things are being included uh, in the CMA, for example, um, in its 2021 vision, mission, and objectives that includes the objective of climate change and sustainability. Um, in, in France, the Autorité de la Concurrence announced in 2020 that it will prioritize cases with competitive harms that are relevant um, for sustainability and uh, that will help uh, transition to low carbon economy. And then, um, as our moderator already said, the Netherlands Competition Authority through its informative guidelines. Um, our experience in Mexico is different. We, we, we don't have guidelines yet, but uh, we've been very active in addressing sustainability concerns through competition advocacy. So the story begins in 2013 when the electricity sector in Mexico suffered a dramatic uh, reform and the country went from having a sector with one state owned enterprise and SOE running a mo monopoly through the entire value chain of the electricity center to a model that now, uh, that now uh, allows private participation in the generation and wholesale of, of electricity. Uh, uh, although the transmission and distribution remains as a state monopoly. So alongside with that reform, um, there was an aim that the industry would increase its uh, generation of electricity from clean resources, reaching uh, 35% of that total by 2024, and then a 50% by um, 20, uh, 20, 2050. And regulation was designed in order to attain that environmental objective, and the mechanism was competition. So the regulatory framework in Mexico, first of all, was designed um, to mm, dispatch the most efficient plants first. And uh, as I said, uh, it now tends to be those based on clean sources, such as wind and solar. And then it also created specifically a market of clean energy certificates, which would allow wholesalers to provide that they were complying with obligations from acquiring and selling certain amount of electricity through, through clean resources. So as a competition agency, we were helping opening this, this market to competition. It's, um, it's a complicated process when you go from a state-owned monopoly to a competitive process. So we were well into advocating um, um, on, 
on how to open this, this market to competition. And so suddenly, as I was saying, we were advocating uh, for Mexican consumers to have at the same time, cheaper and cleaner energy through competition. And um, so everything sounded really nice, but um, the Mexican government in March of 2020 began um, moving backwards on what we call a counter, a counter reform. So first what they did is that they uh, issued, when COVID began, they issued certain guidelines that um, their intention was um, to, they, they would say that their intention was to provide a stability to the grid in times of COVID. So what they did is that they displaced um, the cleaner generators to uh, have the possibility to enter their electricity through the grid and they gave preference to fossil fuel generators. And then also the Ministry of Energy uh, issued a policy that overruled the mechanism of which generators were dispatched in order and efficiency. First, cheap, uh, cheapest energy first, and then um, a, a more expensive energy later. So if they take out that mechanism, then the energy, clean energy that was produced cheaply went at the end of the line instead of being dispatched first. And then um, just recently, and when I say recently, I mean two days ago, there was, um, and there was an, a reform that basically um, is closing the market to competition. And um, so now it's going to be very difficult for clean energy um, electricity companies to compete in the Mexican market. So um, with, with all these movements that the government is, is moving, we have that we don't have uh, competition anymore and sustainability is taken away uh, from, the, from the system. So um, we had a, 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 a nice overlap between competition and environmental goal, goals. And um, it was a very lucky coincidence. Um, but I mean, it, there's, there's, it's, not, it's not that in every market there's going to be this issue that competition and um, sustainability are in, in the same package. I mean, this is an example where, where, where it was, but sometimes it won't. So sometimes it's going to be difficult for competition agencies to advocate for competition and sustainability at, at the same time. So um, these, this, this leads me to some questions regarding uh, the topic of the conference. So first is that um, different jurisdictions have different priorities in terms of, of their policy objectives. In my view, climate change is with no doubt the main challenge shared by the entire world. But um, there could be a distance between environmental sustainability or employment equality or wages um, between different countries. Maybe developed countries have um, some objectives in mind and underdeveloped countries have other objectives in mind. So, um, I mean, why sustainability and not others? That, that's a question. Second, um, I think it's just interesting to recall uh, the global transaction in um, 2016, by which InBev uh, acquired Sap Miller. Um, it's um, this brewery transaction. And it, in, in that time, that transaction raised a number of competition concerns when it was authorized with commitments in, in, in South Africa. So if we remember that case, the South African authority uh, required a package of commitments addressing employment and participation of, of smaller breweries in, in the local market. And at that time, that topic was discussed in the OECD roundtable. And if I recall correctly, at that time, all the competition community agreed that such concerns, um, putting, putting with competition other objectives like uh, small businesses and employment, um, at that time, it was agreed by the competition community that those concerns should not be included alongside uh, the competition policy. So my question there is what has changed in this past five years that has led us to have this discussion today. Um, I mean, as, 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 as the moderator said, there, it's been included in, in, in UK, in the Europe, um, in France, in 
in in the Netherlands. So um, why today are these concerns valid? And I'm not saying it's wrong. Please, please uh, don't, don't. I don't want to make that impression. As I said, I, I believe uh, climate change is the world's biggest issue. It's just interesting to see how the winds have changed. And then finally, a question, um, and, and more in terms of, um, of, of thinking in the international convergence of competition policy, the, the, there could be an issue in terms of how different level, how different priorities along different competition agencies and countries will affect um, global enforcement or uh, enforcement convergence. So um, I don't have the answers to these questions. And um, I think this, this, this discussion is without doubt very, very interesting. And, and as I said, winds have changed and it's very interesting to see that in 2016, um, we were criticizing South Africa and now uh, climate change is an interesting policy objective along with competition. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's, that's a wonderful start into the discussion and uh, uh, you, you provided or, or already the bridge to, to the next uh, panelist, uh, um, who is uh, Temingozi um, uh, Bunakile. I understand that he has some difficulties with his video, but uh, I think he's with us uh, over the phone. So uh, I would like to invite, uh, invite uh, uh, um, uh, him to, to contribute uh, his experience, which indeed also leads to, to one of the aspects which you have mentioned, which is other public policy considerations in particular in, in the context of merger control in South Africa. So, Mr. Bonakile, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I would like to express my gratitude uh, really for uh, being asked to, to join uh, this distinguished uh, panel and conference. Uh, I'd like to use my few minutes uh, firstly to, to sketch the, the uh, context that led uh, into South Africa uh, adopting uh, the public interest considerations in competition law, uh, because it's very, very important uh, 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 to uh, respond to this question that Aleanda uh, is raising about South Africa being somewhat of a, 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 an exception, at least at the time that it adopted uh, 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 this uh, policy. Really the, 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 the reason for this is that uh, South African competition law was as a result of uh, negotiations between social partners. Uh, so immediately after the end of, uh, of apartheid and South Africa was opening up its economy uh, and this economy was highly concentrated uh, because uh, as it would happen with uh, 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 sanctions uh, which were applied to South Africa during that time, uh, a lot of industry uh, used their capital to accumulate uh, other firms. And so you had an unusually uh, uh, high levels of uh, concentration. Uh, and so when uh, the, the uh, democratic, uh, the then new democratic government uh, had to deal with uh, concentration in the economy. Uh, one of the instruments uh, that were touted as a solution to this was competition uh, policy. And so competition policy, uh, if you like, became then a, a very popular aspect of transition, which attracted the interest of all social partners. So you had discussion negotiations between business uh, which at the time was very uh, 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 skeptical of competition law. You also had labor uh, and of course, uh, 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 politicians. And uh, there were trade-offs. And one of the, the, the clear things uh, uh, was that uh, there were a lot of expectations from social partners, uh, such as uh, uh, labor and, and, and civil society about what the promise of this law would entail. Uh, and so, as it were, one of the agreements was to include public interest in competition law uh, as an outcome of these negotiations. And uh, public 
interests in South Africa cover broadly uh, 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 the area of uh, uh, um, employment. Uh, it covers the area of small and medium enterprises. And it also covers uh, the area of uh, getting inclusivity in the economy. In other words, uh, uh, diversifying ownership of the, of the economy. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, achieved by uh, having a clear provision in major regulation that requires that when you consider a merger, you must take into account the impact of the merger on competition, so the SLC test. But in addition to that, you must take into account the impact of the merger on the public interest issues that I have mentioned. Uh, and to facilitate the the, the discussion and ventilation of these public interest issues. There are also participation rights in South Africa by the social partners. For an example, uh, whilst the competition authority makes a decision on all of these, and this was a choice made that uh, it must be the competition authority that must, an independent competition authority that must make the call. Uh, but social partners such as labor, and such as politicians like the Minister of Trade and Industry can intervene in a merger and raise uh, these uh, uh, public interest considerations in the competition authority, but ultimately the competition authority has to decide. Um, <clears throat> so what you have then is a South Africa that over time has developed a practice of how to interpret these provisions and, and some standards, uh, for an example, on when it would intervene and what kinds of uh, 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 intervention, what form this intervention would make, uh, what remedies, for example, uh, would be considered and in what circumstances would public interest issues trump competition uh, uh, issues. And in order to assist uh, participants in the process, particularly business. South Africa has developed, we've developed guidelines that also set out uh, this, this process. This also applies uh, in other areas, but I think it's more prominent in, in, in major regulation. And uh, I want to close by saying that in South Africa, we have recognized the intersection between various uh, uh, um, economic policy instruments, uh, whether it is a trade policy, which often does give rise to tensions uh, uh, with competition law. Uh, and in fact, we talk to the trade policy people all the time uh, about the impact of, for example, their tariff regime on competition, uh, and we talk to the industrial policy people about the impact of their interventions uh, through industrial policy in markets. And in that way, we try and ease the tension, uh, if you like. Uh, and and uh, we have found that having uh, the opportunity to then look at public interest issues ourselves enables us to establish this balance. Uh, we think that, for example, if you were to have ministers uh, taking a decision on these public interest issues, there was a very real danger in South Africa that uh, you would have too much intervention. Uh, and so I think the competition authority has been transparent about how he does it and has been uh, uh, measured. Uh, but what we cannot afford is not to recognize or refuse to accept uh, that the tension between these policy instruments is real and has to be resolved. Uh, and so uh, we like to think about it as, a, as an uncle in the family. 
and it doesn't matter whether you like this uncle or not. He is part of the, uh, of the family. Uh, sometimes he gets drunk, sometimes he may embarrass you, uh, but he is very much a part of the family. Uh, and that's how we treat public interest in South Africa. Um, thanks very much uh, once more for, for the opportunity to explain our position. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Bonakile. Uh, I think uh, that that's very, very helpful uh, to, to have this experience. Um, in particular, um, uh, uh, the focus on the balancing of, of various policy objectives. Um, and we will come back to that in a slightly different framework um, uh, with uh, Professor Wambach, who may also touch upon one or two of these aspects uh, in his presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much again. Um, I would like uh, to come back to, to one of uh, the remarks uh, by, by uh, Alejandra uh, Palacios uh, concerning sustainability, um, uh, because it reminded me um, when she discussed um, the, the implications and the considerations in the um, administrative and also political process, um, um, a little bit uh, to, 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 to the scenery and other, the legal framework of the European uh, Union uh, in, in, in earlier days. Uh, and that's uh, a topic uh, uh, Chairman Snoop would like to address. Um, in addition, and maybe he would like also to share some some uh, background uh, thoughts on on the guidelines uh, in the Netherlands. But uh, I understand his focus will be more the European side. So, Chairman Snoop, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and and thank you for having me and being part of this uh, very interesting debate. And, and I think uh, Chairwoman Palacios' question on, on what has changed since a number of years ago, few, maybe even a few years ago, is, is very relevant. Uh, and it is very relevant to understand where we are in the, in the debate. And my answer to the question uh, for the EU, uh, that is, is that what has changed is that we are returning uh, or are in the process of returning to competition law as it was meant by the founding fathers of the EU treaty. So we kind of strayed away from what it was. And with this discussion, we are going back to the origins of European competition law. And for that, I'd like to take a few minutes to give a broader historical perspective of uh, European competition law. And it's important uh, at the outset uh, that in the discussion, we do not confuse objectives with instruments. And under EU law, uh, competition law and competition policy, I'll come back to that later, is an instrument and not an objective. It was meant by the founding fathers as an instrument, for example, one of the reasons, to create a common market. And being an instrument and not necessarily an objective, means that competition law is also not supreme over any other objectives, policies within the European Union. And uh, when I was in law school in the, in the late 80s, this was clearly explained by my law professor at the time by saying that there is a clear difference between competition law and competition policy. And in the context of Article 85, at the time, he said, paragraph one, the cartel prohibition, that's competition law. Paragraph three, the exemption, that is competition policy. And that was, you know, that, that it was, the, the, oranges, the origins of that are based in the treaty, but also at the time at the regulation 1762, uh, from 19, 1962, uh, where, a system was created where the European Commission had the exclusive competence to uh, give exemptions to the cartel prohibitions. And the, competition, the Commission made ample use of that uh, exemption authority. Uh, and by doing so, it included various objectives, various policies of uh, uh, the European community at the time. So there are cases related to the protection of employment. There are cases related to the protection of the environment. 
there are cases related to cultural objectives and cultural policies. And this change, there was a radical change in this practice uh, with the modernization practice and the introduction of Regulation 1 2003, because we went from an exemption system with an exclusive competence of the European Commission to an exception system with a directly applicable exception to the cartel prohibition of paragraph one. And the direct applicability meant that courts, national competition authorities could directly apply paragraph three and that companies could raise paragraph three as a defense uh, before national courts and before national competition authorities and before the European Commission, obviously. But that something happened at the same time because what the Commission gave with one hand, a kind of decentralization of paragraph three, it took with another hand because the horizontal guidelines that were issued in, the, in that same period of time narrowed the scope of paragraph three to pro-competitive effects and in-market efficiencies. And what happened is that as a result of that, a void started in the, in the a void was created into the legal system. And I'm sure this was not intentional, but as with all interventions into complex systems, there is the law of the unintended consequences. And I think this was one of the unintended consequences that a void was created uh, in, uh, in, the, the, in the framework of the application of European competition law. So what now? And, and I'm not advocating uh, a return to the exemption system uh, and because it had obviously many administrative downside. But I think we, we should go back to that exemption system and what we learned from the good, the good things of that exemption system. And that was the possibility for the European Commission to include you know, fairly and from a policy point of view, um, uh, the other objectives and align competition policy with the other objectives of the EU treaty, including a sustainable economy. And therefore guidance is needed by the European Commission uh, for competition, national competition authorities, for companies and national courts, how to include uh, the um, sustainability objectives of the treaty in the application of paragraph three of the treaty. It's clear that because of the constitutional composition of the uh, European Commission, the nexus should be with the European Commission. And that's also why we said, okay, we, we are going to draft uh, sustainability guidelines, but as a source of inspiration for the European Commission, we hope that the European Commission will take over our ideas and thoughts in that, in those guidelines, because we believe that the guidelines that we created um, provide for a nice uh, balanced view on how to balance competition policy objectives uh, with sustainability goals. Um, and in, in, in the situation uh, of the European Union, I think that answers um, Andreas's earlier question, of course, who should be entitled to make that balance, to align uh, competition, uh, competition law, of competition policy with other objectives. And of course, that is a decision that every jurisdiction should make. That is, the, if it, that is a decision that uh, a democratically elected legislator should make. Should I give the authority to the competition authority, uh, like uh, was done in South Africa for good reasons? Or should it, be, should it stay with the legislator, which is also, uh, can also be um, uh, argued? Or like in the context of the European, European Union, should it stay with the Commission? But it is important that someone has the ability, an authority, a legislator, or, um, uh, or, or a court, to align these objectives of 
competition law with other objectives. Again, competition law, in any event within the European context, is not an instrument, but an objective. And therefore, someone should be able to align those, uh, to align the, the, the different instruments to achieve different objectives. And in Europe, the European Commission is the best place to do that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much um, um, for for this, Martin. Uh, I think it's it's not only particularly interesting and comprehensive; it also answers uh, to a certain extent the question which uh, was sent by Peter Freeman um, again uh, earlier uh, um, and in advance of, of this conference, uh, because he's, he raised the question, or rather the statement: um, um, uh, "It is one thing to prevent competition policy from harming the attainment of important." sustainability and environmental objectives, but quite another to incorporate those objectives into competition law itself. I think uh, you have uh, responded to that question, um, uh, not only from a substantive um, uh, perspective, but also in terms of, of process, who should be responsible, um, if not politicians, um, it could be the European Commission in the context of enforcing, enforcing European competition or taking account of, of other policy objectives as well. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, and with that, without further ado, directly to Professor Wambach, because I know that he, he has also some thoughts about responsibility of agencies, of politicians, of the courts. Um, and once again, I would like to remind you that uh, he's not only uh, one of the preeminent uh, uh, academics in, in our country uh, and in, in Europe, uh, he's also the former chairman of the Monopolis uh, Commission, uh, which is a uh, um, a special animal uh, in, in our framework, legal framework, uh, and as I can assure you, uh, a very important one because uh, while it has no real authority to decide, to make orders, it is very strong and very powerful in contributing to the public debate. So, Professor Wambach, your floor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ingo, and uh, thanks for, for joining this uh, panel. It's, it's uh, fascinating to listen to you. Maybe if I can add one comment uh, on what you were just saying, Commissioner Snoopy said, there's com uh, competition law, there's competition policy, and there's competition economics. <laughs> and in the end, you know, it has to be right on balance uh, in all three fields. Um, but I would like to use my minutes that we have in Germany, actually, since 1978, we are already using public policy objectives in competition cases, and that's our instrument of the ministerial approval. So what happens if two companies want to merge and the uh, Bundeskartellamt says, no, um, uh, prohibits the merger, then the companies can go to the minister and say, but for public policy reasons, please allow the merger. And uh, then the monopolies commission has to write a recommendation and then the minister decides. And um, so I would like from this experience, I want to make three points and I think they have relevance for the debate we are, we are having today. One is that it's very rarely used. So in, since 1978, it was, there were only 23 cases where undertakings applied to the minister. So that makes it once every four years and the minister decided positively in 10 cases out of these 23. So once every four years. So, and um, so it seems to be that there's often competition is actually quite good in helping public policy goals. So there is not this real you know, a divergent between these two goals. Second observation, we always debate very hard what is really the public policy goal. And we are, we are talking here a little bit like that if there's a clear, you know, a clear goal, but it's not clear at all. And for example, in a recent case, the minister wanted to grant the merger, actually he did, uh, to preserve collective employee rights. But then in a, a court decision, a preliminary court decision, the court found that collective employee rights cannot be a matter of public policy, because otherwise greater importance would be attached to positive freedom of association than to negative freedom of association. So that makes me wonder, you know, actually I was surprised by this result, but what is really a public policy goal? And is it the goal of, you know, the, the government? Is it does everyone has to agree on it? And it becomes even harder, I think, if it comes to sustainability issues. And that's, you know, take your Dutch case, which I found very impressive, uh, the coal industry. So coal-fired plants, uh, fired power plants intended to cooperate to exit the market jointly. And um, then ACM decided that that would not be, 
you know, the positive effect would be zero or very small because uh, of the European emission certificate trading system. So if the Dutch use less certificates, you know, if they go out of coal, someone else uses more. So the net CO2 effect is zero, uh, more or less. Yeah? And that's a great argument and um, uh, it's correct. Yeah, however, <laughs> so it makes a horror point. Um, if the Dutch go out of um, uh, coal, the prices for certificates will fall. And so that makes it for the other countries or for the other firms, even in the Netherlands, easier to comply with the European certificate system. Yeah. So is that not a public policy goal? If you help the others to, you know, to, to deal with the constraints of, uh, of sustainability. And actually, the second point, uh, it gets even, you know, more that you think about it. You in the Netherlands propose to the firms they should take a compensating amount of emission rights off the market. Yeah, which they refused. Yeah, but that would have been a clear reduction in CO2 emissions. Yeah, so if they take the certificates out of the market, they're gone, and that's a reduction in CO2 emissions. However, that would have been a reduction beyond the European goals. The number of certificates, that's the European goal. If you take certificates out of the market, you reduce more than the European goals. So is that still the public policy goal? If you do more than the European public policy goal, yeah. So actually, I don't know. Yeah, and that makes it really hard. We have to think hard, what is the public policy goal and how do those markets interact? Third point I want to make is that, how do you balance these effects? Yeah, and I looked at the history of our ministerial approval cases because there we are also balancing, you know, the competitive effect, which is negative, and the public policy effect, which is positive. And I was involved in two cases, and actually I was very lucky because in these two cases, we didn't find a positive public policy effect. So it was very easy to balance those two because zero is smaller than everything else. Yeah? But um, in all the other cases, we never made a quantitative analysis. It was always a qualitative analysis. Uh, analysis yeah? So one case, for example, was um, the hospitals merging and um, for competition, competitive reasons, it should have been forbidden, but one was a university hospital and for scientific reasons, it was good. And then you had qualitative arguments. But it's hard, you know, if you if you're an authority, just to make it on basis of qualitative arguments. I think we need to learn much more what are the quantitative arguments. So these three points that I wanted to make, and you know, for me, the conclusion or you know, whatever the take, the, the message um, out of these points is there's so much fuzz in still around this. You know, what is the public policy goal? How do we measure it? You know, who decides? So I think we should think hard about the institutional setup, which is the institutional checks and balances. So one thing I would, you know, suggest is that, you know, why should the competition authority decide on the weight of the public policy goal? Why not another authority? Why not an independent group? A competition authority knows how to weigh competition. An independent, another group could be another authority decides on the public policy goal. Why don't have independent experts from the outside? Yeah, so like in Germany, it's a monopoly commission. Why not have a kind of a European monopolist commission? experts which are independent to make a recommendation, not to decide, you know, but to make a recommendation to have more transparency. And finally, that's also debate we're having in Germany, um, legal recourse is really important. Yeah? So who makes a decision and can a company sue? And who can sue? It's just competitors, but I think it should also, for example, be consumer advocates. So if the issue is the public policy goal, I think the public should have a voice in it in some degree or another. And um, so that's the point I want to make. I think the institutions have met, met us a lot because it's just the formal setup there's a lot of fuss in this around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Achim, for, 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 for this uh, new perspective on, on, on the matter, also from an institutional perspective. And you done it, you raised a question um, to the European Commission. So I think uh, it is fairly easy to, to simply refer to, uh, simply refer to Olivier Gasson, the Director General of, of uh, DG Comp. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I'd like to thank Sandra Smoot first and the Bundes Catalan for this very topical event and, uh, and this great, great panel. Um, Colleagues have, have covered different uh, uh, topics already. Uh, what I'd like to say is that core to the answers to the question that, that is asked to this panel is the fact that competition policy does not operate in a vacuum. And I, I would very much agree with Martin, Martin Snoop in that respect. 
because I think it is very rightly observed that competition policy is an instrument. Uh, by way of anecdote, my first boss, competition commissioner Carol Vermeert in the 90s, uh, used to repeat it all the time. I think competition is not a goal of public policy. It is a tool to an end. So we are indeed one among many public policies, but I still tend to think that competition policy has nonetheless a specific place among policies because its very goal is to make sure that in a market economy, the competitive process is not altered, resulting in markets not working efficiently as they should in ensuring allocative efficiencies. So in other words, competition policy is, is really the policy that avoids that market mechanism are captured by some players to their private interest and uh, not to the, to the collective interest. Uh, this said, of course, uh, markets work uh, within a level playing field that is defined by public rules. And of course, also, the competition process is not a world of black and white, but rather a continuum of shades of gray. So what I mean to say is that there are a variety of different possible competition policies that can be developed on the basis of the same standards of competition law. And if you want to be convinced about that, the lawyers among you know very well that Article 106 of the treaty, for example, was for the first 35 years uh, of, the, of the EU considered as protecting national monopolies for public utilities. And for the next 35 years, that's prohibiting them. And uh, actually not a comma of uh, the article was changed, uh, which proves that uh, a good standard of law can accommodate quite a wide variety of, of policies. Um, accordingly, there is almost always more than one possible legitimate cause of, cause of action in individual cases, uh, with maybe the exception of hardcore cartel and, uh, and prices. So of course, competition authorities, when they make this judgment within this gray area, internalize the values and the broader objectives of the society they are part of. And uh, you could not explain otherwise that when we are faced with uh, cases that have a global dimension, it happens that very respectable competition authorities reach different conclusions. Uh, uh, but these conclusions are all within the bandwidth of what you could legitimately uh, conclude. That happened, for example, quite many times in history uh, between the US authorities and the European authorities. So, one of these uh, objectives uh, is sustainability, and it's, it's, uh, it's a very important objective at the moment because getting the green and the digital transition right is the defining challenge of our time. Uh, and this is especially true right now within the EU because we are starting our way out of the current economic crisis with an ambitious European recovery program. So this is about building a competitive, low carbon intensity resilient industrial base in Europe. And this will not happen, of course, without getting a lot better in digitization than we are. And that uh, we need to succeed if we want to uh, be carbon neutral as uh, we played to be uh, uh, by 2050. So as uh, Mrs. Vestager has said earlier on, all the EU policies and all policymakers will have to play their part in this European, in this European effort. And that of course includes competition policy within the limits of its, uh, of its remit, of course. So Mrs. Vestager already mentioned uh, the broad European debate and of course the state aids, which are extremely important in supporting the Green Deal. Uh, uh, but well, as we have only very limited time, uh, let me please zoom in on one area in particular, which is antitrust. I think you know that we had this, uh, this, this um, uh, very wide consultation uh, very interesting results, a very interesting conference uh, in order to discuss the results. And consensus uh, happens in, in three principal areas. Sustainable development concerns businesses in all sectors of Europe economy. Businesses need clear rules and they need legal certainty in order to be able to maximize the potential to contribute to the greening of the economy. And cooperation between businesses uh, will be needed and some comfort may be necessary for long-term cooperation when displaying novel issues, or for example, to avoid situations of uh, what I would call first mover disadvantage, uh, when uh, a, a full sector should move to a different technology, for example, but if you're the, only, the first one to do it, 
you will suffer a terrible disadvantage and will be put out of market. So we will need to have some form of coordination in a number of limited, limited occurrences uh, like this one. Uh, but competition uh, remains the basis uh, for a strong incentive for firms to innovate. And innovation is what we need most if we want to meet successfully uh, the challenge to be carbon neutral by 2050. At the same time, during our consultations, uh, we also had different views on what needs to be clarified and how this should be done. And here again, Martin uh, uh, took uh, some examples that are quite, quite interesting. The first topic would be is on how to cooperate. It seems that examples of sustainability practices raising antitrust concerns remain actually limited. But nevertheless, we do hear that sustainability initiatives are being slowed down or not taking place because of fears that they may infringe the antitrust rules, in particular Article 101 of the treaty. So the, the underlying question really is how deep and close the business relationships are allowed to get when companies pursue a common sustainability goals. And in this regard, uh, the assessment of information exchanges, standard setting, joint purchasing, maybe areas uh, where maybe more clarity would be needed from European competition authorities and the commission as well. Second, on what benefits, on what beneficiaries? Uh, another important theme is, is whether and how to assess sustainability benefits. And uh, at the same time, we should be very careful to avoid greenwashing as well. So there I can be relatively short because uh, Martin uh, touched the point already quite a bit. There is almost a consensus that genuine sustainability benefits can be accommodated in the antitrust assessment, at least where it leads to higher quality or innovative products. I mean, green innovation is like any innovation and it should be favored by, by uh, competition policy. Where views diverge is on how flexible the conditions of Article 1013 sh should be and how much they could be stretched to accommodate a broader range of sustainability benefits. And this is exactly the debate that uh, Martin uh, uh, elaborated on. It has to do with uh, uh, out of uh, uh, market efficiencies. It has to do with, uh, are you, will you be treating the same or not? The category of uh, 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 consumers that benefit from the practice, say those that benefit from lower gas uh, emission in China, and those that suffer from the practice, say those that uh, will suffer higher prices in Europe. How do you make this uh, uh, balancing act uh, effectively? Is it possible? Uh, can you do it within the legal standards? Uh, these are the questions that we need to, uh, to, to discuss. Many ideas are uh, driven by the desire to contribute to the green objectives. At the same time, I believe that we need to remain focused and practical. Our duty is to approach these ideas with responsibility and uh, to reflect thoroughly on the, how they can be uh, pursued uh, in harmony with our primary tasks, what I call the gray zone, uh, so that you ensure the well-functioning of the markets and fair competition while favoring whenever possible within the standard, uh, uh, the achievements of, uh, of green uh, objective. Third, how to make these clarifications. So my sense and the, the result of the consultation is that the legal framework is being seen as uh, broadly okay and uh, sufficient, I'm talking antitrust of course, but it needs clarifications. Uh, and during our many discussions, we had several proposals on how to do this. And let me name just but a few, uh, updating the existing guidelines on vertical and horizontal agreements, extending the scope of the block exemptions, uh, having more of an open door policy than we have had so far and allowing businesses to share their concerns with the commission without risking follow-up investigations and prohibition and uh, uh, being a bit more proactive with individual guidance letters or even in some cases, uh, posit positive decision. So quite a lot of uh, food for thought for us going forward because as uh, Margaret Vestager said, we will have a very busy year uh, in terms of uh, interpretative notices and clarifying our uh, policy in this respect. Thanks. Olivier, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh...
uh, for for this uh, closing the circle. I think uh, it's it's been a wonderful wrap up. What I particularly like, uh, if if you may allow the word from a lawyer in private practice, um, being practical, I think is is certainly very helpful um, for for enterprises who have uh, to to consider competition on the one hand, but also want to achieve. Uh, 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 goals uh, with respect uh, to economic success, success, and and as well as uh, uh, meeting uh, the policy goals of, of uh, sustainability. So thank you, thank you very much for that. I'm mindful of the time. Um, we certainly uh, would be able to to have a longer discussion on all the, of the topics, but uh, I think uh, I have to turn over back to President Munt. Uh, thank you all at the panel uh, for your wonderful insights, uh, for the contributions. Um, I'm very grateful for that and uh, uh, thank you for, for participating. So, President Mont, uh, back to you. Well, this was already it. Um, our mini international Qatar conference for this year. Um, I think, or I hope that you have inspiring uh, three hours behind you and you really got some food for thought. I think we have seen a, a rich discussion on, on a couple of issues. Uh, we've heard the keynote uh, interview with Commissioner Vestager and, uh, and Minister Altmaier and uh, the sound ideas that they have for industrial and competition policy. I think we all share the same goals, be it by doing industrial beat, by doing competition policy, um, that we want strong e economies for the benefit of consumers and for, for the benefit of the society as a whole. I think uh, our keynote speaker, Christian Klein, gave us his industry insight, which was very much appreciated, um, and are calling also upon us to do that together and to cooperate in order to, to reach that goal. Um, the first panel focused on big tech, um, I think that showcased very, very well what we have to do now as competition agencies, maybe especially over here in Germany where we have new tools at hand and we, we are, where we are preparing new cases in, in the digital economy. A second panel addressed the future of public policy objectives. Um, that topic has many supporters, of course it does, who could deny uh, who could deny that we need to do lots of things and maybe that we have to change things, have to change laws as well. But I think it remains a complex uh, topic, uh, how to get out the best deal for the consumer if ever it comes to attention between competition and the question of sustainability. Um, having said that, um, what remains for me is to, to speak out very special thanks to the keynote speakers, to the panelists, to the moderators. A big thank you to the conference team. I'm very happy that everyone, everything went smoothly. I could say as usual, but this was under, under special circumstances. I'm very happy that everyone, everything went well from a technical point of view. And everything that remains now is for me to invite you to the 21st edition of this conference. It will be in Berlin in 2022. I'm pretty sure that we will meet in person and I can already promise you today that the next conference in 2022 in Berlin will be quite a special conference. So having said that, Goodbye to all of you. Stay safe uh, and healthy and see you soon. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us.